Ah, well, thanks, Mark. Kia ora koutou. Mane i kia koutou, hui hui mai nei. Welcome to this, the second and third workshop. Discuss the feedback received on the draft land and water plan. And I'd just like Eva to start us off with the kara kia. Mane na tātou. 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 Tui a ki roto, tui a ki waho, tui a i te here tangata, karongo te pō, karongo te ao, tui a te hupa takata, he a wai ki nui, a wai ki roa, a wai ki pamāma, tūturu whakamaua, tēnā, tēnā, haumi e, hui e, tāna e. Tāna mai ki a Edward for Karakia. This is a public workshop and it's being recorded and the recording we put on the website later in the day. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the public gallery. Um, it's sort of free over there. We appreciate your interest in the plan and your input into the plan's development up to date. I'd like to welcome um, the staff who have been involved in developing the plan both on Zoom and here in the chambers today. It's been a big job. Thank you for your not insignificant commitment to the plan and your willingness to work with us, the councillors, to ensure we first understand the plan's contents and then providing possible options to enable rigorous debate. Welcome to the councillors of the ESP committee. Uh, it's been a busy time for us. Thank you for turning up week after week. We cannot fault our dedication. Finally, welcome to Ewida, Ewi representative, and thank you for the input into the plan. I'll be here with. Um, by the end of today, our aim is to discuss the remaining feedback and offer an agreed direction so staff can continue with the development of the plan. The current plan, the current land and water plan is outdated and not fit for purpose. It is our responsibility to provide a direction in line with our commitment as councillors to protect and enhance Otago's environments for future generations. Yes, there have been political changes, but we are here to deliver environmental outcomes that will result in improvements to the way we manage our waterways, our lakes and our streams. To achieve these outcomes, we need, we need to have a robust regulatory plan that sits along, alongside or underpinning our non-regulatory opportunities. It is our job to deliver on our Council's commitments on the Resource Management Act. We have agreed a process and time frame with the outgoing Minister of the Environment. This commitment does not change with any change in the governing parties or coalitions. Yes, the government of the day may change the process or parts of the process. If required, we may need to pivot to meet government expectations. There will be opportunities when this can happen if needed. For now, we need to play the ball in front of us and not overthink the future. The plan started with community input to develop their visions and values for our waterways. These community values form the foundations of our regional policy statement, the founding, the founding document for our plan. We still, we still have water quality and quantity challenges that we can and need to address now to fill our commitment to the Otago people. Like last week, the aim is to keep the workshop pre-structured. Um, there'll be an introduction to each paper. We'll then have questions, which are the what, how, why, and when's, and not stories that start with once upon a time before the question. And then we'll have a rigorous debate where everybody gets the opportunity to have their say. Right. You won't have debate. We'll have a regulatory commentary. <laughs> we'll have a talk about it. Providing to provide a consensus of our preferred direction. We need to keep the workshop moving along to ensure that all the remaining topics are covered today. And we have concise questions and thought out to thought out commentary while respecting each other's opinions. We may even finish early. Thank you. I would just like to um, hand over now. Oh, also, welcome Matthew Cullen Clark. Um, he's here as well to um, assist the staff. And I believe Jack she is on. Oh, she'll be on a bit she'll later. She'll be coming on. on. Yes, yeah. she is. Okay. So, thank you much. So, I'll just um, pipe glass. Sorry, Andrew. Can I just ask a question before we start? Mm -hmm. um, in the draft rules, there is a proposal around uh, prohibiting uh, wastewater, treated wastewater um, <coughs> to be discharged to a water body. When do we get a chance to talk about that topic? Or have I missed something? 
that was we had asked last week for any topics that weren't on the list to be um so if we've got time at the end we can i would certainly want to talk about them if they are or certainly on the 14th if we don't okay if we don't get time yeah, yeah i'm just thank you um andrew because i had spoken to her and, and she was going to, to offer the opportunity to make a list of other things we'd like to talk about that are not so in that, the documents that also jogs my memory when we talk about setbacks for stock exclusion, we will have an opportunity to talk about the, the draft rule that mentions uh, shifting fences, existing fences to um, to comply with the new rule. So and that's all part of see a com any commentary in that in the discussion about that particular aspect of the proposal. But anyway, happy to raise it then. So that's cool. Yeah, no, yeah, no, that'll be yeah, for sure. Thank, yep. thank you, Andrew. Cool. Thank you. Mr. Right. Chair. No, we'll just, oh, I'll just go to the paper. Sorry. sorry, you said um, that we'd have a chance to discuss the non regulatory opportunities um, earlier. Thank you. I'd love to know when that is because we've got some very clear opportunities that have been um, outlined by in the new coalition agreements with storage and investment into infrastructure. And yet, if we don't look at those in the <coughs> process, we may be undoing those opportunities by the regulatory framework we're set in. And that's definitely with the outstanding water bodies and some of the wetlands, which are artificial already, um, that are being protected from that sort of development. And it seems to me, so, so the question is, when are those opportunities? So uh, just to reply to that. So I actually said, um, we need a rob robust regulatory plan that sits built of the side and non-regulatory committees. I didn't say we we're going to be discussing the non-regulatory opportunities here today. I said they were setting aside but, but, opportunities in the future. But the, sorry, the question is, how can we ensure that the opportunities are left open if we're doing regulations that limit those opportunities? So to refer to you, Anita? Oh, look, I, I mean, I, I'm here and I, I'm in charge of the planning part of the conversation. And as a council, <coughs> you've got wider opportunities in terms of non-regulatory um, aspects. Um, there are ways that we can pivot as the plan goes through the process once we start to understand more about our central government expectations in that non-regulatory space. Um, but this is, I guess, I've got quite a narrow scope in terms of what, what we're doing and it's the regulatory stuff. So we said that, Kate, we can talk about, you know, as we're going through, if there's you know, specific opportunities in each section, we can, that can form part of our discussion as we go through each item. Thank you. Thank Can you. I just, um, oh, Gary, so you first. Was going okay, to address the... Yeah, well, I think I just wanted to say to you, Mr. Chair, I understand your your opening speech and that um, that your commentary around uh, the former minister and the direction of the former minister. Um, there's been a very clear message from the new coalition government that there will be changes to the previous regulations and uh, our community and unfortunately us are caught in the middle of a process that is putting in place what might be either former regulations or new regulations. And it still really concerns me and many members of my community who have been contacting over the past few days uh, about how we are tracking and where we may end up. So I just wanted to highlight that to you in response to your opening statements. Thank you for that response, Gary. I'll just add a little bit. Um before we, we throw and get, um, get this underway. So uh, absolutely appreciate the uh, commentary that has been um, cir circulating in the last uh, week or so around potential changes to legislation, probably most relevant for this process, the NPS um, freshwater. So um, I guess staff, uh, staff advice at this stage is to carry on with the process we've got in terms of today and the 14th of December, but we are very aware of the need to bring forward to the council table any risks that are made that we become aware of in terms of uh, details that start to come out about any any potential changes from the government. The issue we've got at the moment is that we have a very high level statement and no detail about what that means. We have an NPS in place. We have an indication that it will be reviewed. We don't know time frame and we don't know details um, and we do have a need well, we do have um, instructions of staff at the moment to carry on with this process to achieve notification by June. Um, there are, as you would imagine, um, all of the regional councils currently go through the, going through the planning process have a significant interest in what those changes to the NPS might be. Uh, and we will be awaiting some um, 
and more information from ministry officials once they've started to receive that from um, incoming ministers. So we will keep this table um, abreast of anything we find we hear in that space, particularly as it relates to risks to this organisation as we move through the process. Um, we'd expect a further update, I, I would imagine, and I, I can't say for sure, but I would expect we would have something further by um, ahead of our next scheduled um, workshop on the 14th of December. So we'll make sure we can share that at that stage. And then I would assume there would be further details in the new year um, that, that we will continue to share as well. But our advice as staff at this stage is to carry on as scheduled with this process. Um, we believe that if there are changes and they are signaled, we have the ability to adapt the plan to meet those at a stage um, ahead of our notification in June. Thank you. So um, I'm really happy with that. And sorry, not, there's no criticism of staff on this. This is our decision to make the ministers I totally, we own that around this table. Um, what I am concerned about though, is that it's not just risks, it's also opportunities. And the, um, we need to be have both in our, at, at the forefront. Um, and can I, the reason I'm pushing this is that with storage, I'm frustrated that this plan is looking backwards rather than forwards. We're looking at climate change. We may have significant changes in, snow um, storage, which has been the form of storage to um, keep water in our rivers for years. If that changes, we need to be actively looking at um, and, and preparing ourselves for storage at high level of rain and runoff. Um, and we're not. And we're actually writing rules in here that could preclude those things happening. Um, and so that's where I'm coming from, is that we have to be future focused. We have to make sure that the rivers are flowing with high environmental standards. And I can't see that in the climate change environment that we are actually looking at that as well as we could be. So in that context, there's some wonderful opportunities being um, foreshadowed by the government and we have to make sure that we're not precluding those around the table today. Thank you, Gates. Uh, one more point of clarification, please. Um, thank you, Richard, for those comments. Um, can I just understand when you say we're moving forward under instruction, you mean the instruction of council? Correct, the, instruction? the commitment the council made to meet the June deadline of the, the minister. So if council had, the, the council rulers had enough concern around the direction and the implications on community or whatever in progressing, then council would be the ones making that. that so, I mean, obviously decision. council is driving our work program um, and we, we are... Um, working towards the commitment made for a June notification, and, and those are our current instructions from, from the table. Thank you. Uh, yes, Richard. Uh, sorry to prolong this conversation. We do need to uh, get into it, but I just think it's important to state that there is uncertainty, that's right, and we do need to monitor that closely. But there's some things that are certain, and one of them is that we've got a really outdated water plan. So, um, yeah, that was 2004, it became operative, and it's now nearly 2024. They're meant to be reviewed every 10 years in entirety. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, so we put in place a program to review that, and we are able to meet that by mid next year. Uh, so, yeah, prolonging that... Um, it is possible and we do need to look at um, pivoting, but that's one thing that doesn't change. Environmental bottom lines for waterways also don't change. We've got the same scientists who know the same things and they will appear in front of a either an RMA commission panel or in front of a freshwater, whatever it is, they're going to say the same thing about what a waterway needs to be healthy. Um, we do need to make some changes because, for example, we've got 66 out of 196 sites that we monitor in Otago that have at least one parameter that's not up to scratch at the moment. Um, it's unlikely that a government would roll out tools in the toolbox. They never have before in terms of a council needing, you know, councils across New Zealand have a whole range of different approaches. So it's kind of usually up to us what we want to implement. Farm planning's a tool in the government's toolbox. It's a tool in our toolbox as well. Uh, strong signals there. Uh, and markets are becoming strengthened in terms of their environmental focus too. So in the weighing of economics versus environment, then um, 
the environment and economics are one. So, yeah, there's a lot of factors that point towards it's very important that we continue to have these conversations as a council. And I think we just need to get on with it at the moment and keep a um, very watchful eye on what is happening. Thank you, Richard. Uh, well said. You said what? Well, just a notice, I, prior to this meeting being extended, I have a meeting at 9.30 for about half an hour. And I'll be Thank you, Edward. Awesome. Uh, Kevin? But we just updated uh, pages 1 to 11. Those, um, there's been those update come through late this, yesterday. Uh, I'll let Anita explain to you. Yep. So we circulated an update yesterday afternoon about three o'clock. Um, they've just been, um, we'd inadvertently uh, included only the winter residual flows from yep. the Manahati Kia. So this one's got the yeah. winter and summer. So this was updated. There's an updated one gone online, and we've italicized and footnoted the changes so that everyone's clear. So all the notes that I had on here have just gone. So something's happened in Diligent that. All the work that's all right, I'll have to remember it. Yeah, mm. thanks. Well, say thanks, can I? Wait, any other? Um, do we have any other commentary around uh, where the process is sitting as we before we begin? Um, if not, we'll um. Carry on, thank you. For that. All right, thank you. Um, let me try that. So, um, this purpose slide might look familiar. It is the same as the one you saw last week, but just a reminder of what we're here for. Uh, to talk through the feedback that we've received on the draft provisions through the community engagement process um, and also some internal reviews so that you can provide input and discussion on those matters that might require revisiting of the overall approach. So we'll be covering quite a few of those today um, and those that we received a lot of feedback on. So as I said last week, we're not covering all of the topics or all of the feedback that we received through in these two workshops, but the team is reading, has read it all, I should say, and is looking at how to incorporate it into the drafting. So next week, we'll be bringing a paper to council that summarise all, summarises all of the feedback. And then the following week, on the 14th of December, we'll be working through the full draft plan provision. So we'll be going through every single thing, which will be um, a long day, no doubt. Um, so this slide and the next one shows the topics that we're covering today and the order that we're covering them in. So it does differ from the order in Appendix 2, and we apologise for that, it's to do with staff availability, um, and also just making sure that we're covering the topics that require the most input and direction. Thanks. Sorry, that's, I, I absolutely find that your staff, but we actually have applied people, I've got people, uh, people said they're coming this afternoon because they thought primary production was going to be in the order of things up. And it's just about treating people with respect that we tell people that these this, the order is changing because we highlighted a different order. And I'm just noting that, yeah, that's, but having said that, some people in the room are probably delighted. Uh, some yeah, people turned right. up last week thinking it was going to be primary production and had seen the order for today and coming this afternoon. No, take a note of those. Yeah, uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to pop out and give them a call if you want. If you want me to do that, I don't think they're available. But yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Um, Kate, Ms. Jet, it's possible to get that screen off. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so um, so we've got Matthew. And Jackie will be coming online later. Delina's online and Tom's here as well. Both Tom, in fact. Um, so we've provided options for most topics where we need guidance about which ones to work up into the draft provisions. But generally, we have included preferred options. Um, what I would say is most of the topics today here, uh, where there are options, we, we are thinking that a change to um, what what went out for engagement probably is needed, um, just based on the feedback that we've received. Um, but again, we have included all the options that are workable. So um, it's for you to provide guidance about which you prefer. 
in the next version. Um, and finally, just before we get started, there were a few things that we said we'd come back to you on. Um, most of these we will cover on the 14th of December, um, but I've got some information on su suction dredge mining and mining permits and stuff that I'll share with you. But we'll do that just immediately before lunch or just be a few, few minutes on that. Um, but otherwise, um, if there are any questions on... Uh, will that include the reference to uh, sheep setbacks that Council Sumrall asked on that we hadn't yep, received? Yeah, and there's commentary in the paper already about um, sheep setbacks. On this one now? That was in the original one, yeah. so it hasn't changed. And the one that the, the one that was sent to us is an answer to... The one that was sent to us is an answer to Council Sumrall's request. The issues and options paper, that was the original... Mm, yeah. yeah, so there's something about sheep in there. Yeah. That was the original issues and options paper from a few months ago. Well, I, well, I'd be really like to be directed to that because I read the paper and I couldn't, I didn't see the word sheep mentioned in there. So it's a footnote on the original paper. Mm -hmm. It was just a footnote. Yeah. Very highly. Yeah, so it was informed by a report from Abacus Bio on like options for going further to reduce losses. So um, we can. In fact, I imagine that. Has council, has, council, has council got the report, the abacus bio the report? Is in the yeah, okay. So there is, yeah, there will be more. Does the abacus bio report some of the suite of stuff in, in here? So perhaps if um, Tom or somebody could pick that out and forward it around. That'd be good. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. So that, so essentially it's um, up until lunchtime, we're mostly focused on water quality um, and or a little bit after lunch and that, and then depending on timing wise, how, obviously about how things go, then we move into water quantity a bit later after lunch. So if we need to notify people of that, we can do that. Yep. All right. I'll hand over to Matthew. Thank you. Three is the first topic. It's on page five of the handout. It's a white block under the blue. For those of you following the attachment. As you'll be aware, there was substantial feedback on the forestry provisions, and I've put up there a, a bullet-pointed summary of what the draft provisions set out. The issues that were of most significant concern uh, were particularly the 50 metre setback requirement for uh, land over 10 degrees in slope noting that most forestry in Otago is at over 10 degrees in slope. Uh, and there was also a range of um, other feedback about requiring a resource consent for forestry. So I've summarized that there. Um, through, following the drafting of the the provisions, the government changed the National Environmental Standard. Um, so it's now called the National Environmental Standard for Commercial Forestry. That does uh, simplify some provisions and so um, strengthened um, some harvest provisions in particular. We have put in the paper well, this one, we've put together a suite of suggested changes. Um, these aren't necessarily, um, this one's slightly different in that it is not really a series of options. Uh, it's more some suggested changes to you to respond to that feedback. Um, the first of those is to reduce that setback required uh, to 20 metres uh, from a lesser extent of water bodies. 
The second element is the merger of the plantation forestry rules with the carbon forestry rules. And that really responds to that simplification of the national environmental standard that has occurred. And the third is to separate out um, rules and controls for the planting element and the harvest element, given that there is tends to be a, a long period of relatively static in between. So yes, happy to, to answer questions. And... Oh, sorry, just, well, just before we carry on, I'll just make mention that Councillor um, Mal Malcolm has got an engagement at some stage, so she he nips out, that'll be why. Um, so we'll take questions. I'll have um, Kate and then I'll have Tim. Right. Matthew, I'm just wondering, and this is a question I posed some time ago, is what do you do with that area if there is a setback? And I'm wondering if <coughs> we should be considering a permanent plantings that protect the riparian area um, as a default. So say, say if you've got 15, and this is also about fire control, because if you put some species of natives in, you have a much better fire control and actually activate it better. And, and I like to mention in this, but not up here, of using forestry plans in the same way as farm plan. I think that's a really, but they, you actually encourage them to use that land for a productive use, which is both sequestration but also as fire breaks of some sort. So I'm just wondering, you know, I, I, I moot on which the setback, whatever the setback is, but you could have a smaller setback if it's managed and planted appropriately that um, does that job for you, surely or not. In answer to that question, yes. Um, the quality of that, that setback planting will have a high influence on its effectiveness. Yep. Uh, and a densely planted um, setback is, is always going to be better than something that is left bare or, or um, poorly managed. Um, that is one of the uh, elements of um, that we would be looking at through that restricted discretionary activity consent framework for greater than 10 hectares is that uh, management of the setbacks and the critical source areas that will eventuate that uh, later through the process. Thank you. I have um, Tim and then Andrew. Yes. Um, initially, we had a 15 metre setback, and there was obviously science around establishing that 15 metre setback. Um, now it's been reduced back to a 20 metre setback, and there's obviously science around that as well. So what is the difference between, in science, between the 50 metre setback and now the suggested 20 metre setback? Tell them if I can help a little bit. Um, so generally speaking, setbacks uh, um, uh, have a diminishing rate of return with distance. Um, so if you, if you think about a, uh, if you think of, about a graph um, with your uh, levels of nutrient uh, runoff reduction up on the up curve and um, on your bottom bar uh, distance. Um, that line has a curve that flattens off at the top. Uh, you still get benefit uh, at 50 metres, but after 50 metres, that benefit starts to reduce to negligible levels. Um, but the curve is uh, probably uh, I'm trying to remember this one off by heart, but it's probably at its steepest at around that 20 meter mark. So you still you get your third, your best bang for buck in terms of meters at around the 20 meter mark rather than 50. 50 is at the on a high end, of, or you start to see diminishing returns at that. Level. And is that specifically forestry as opposed to then setbacks generally? Um, uh, but the okay. same goes for forestry. Anywhere where you've got sediment or um, things that are mobile, with nutrients, um, phosphorus, all of that sort of thing, yeah. um, those principles hold true. Okay. So in terms of um, uh, stock setbacks, what are we talking about? Five metres or ten metres? Uh, so I think it's a discussion for later in the day. I think you've got okay. options. So, so if we're saying that the impact of forestry is very similar to the impact of stock on setbacks, why are we still looking at a 20 metre setback for forestry when it could be 10 or 5? So I think there's, there's 
quite a big difference in the, uh, the mechanism you're using setbacks for um, between stock and uh, borrow street. Uh, so borrow street, typically the setbacks are functional and operating during harvest time and through that replanting cycle. So you've got a short duration uh, of uh, reasonably high, or very high disturbance. Um, whereas in, a, uh, in an agricultural landscape, you're talking about more persistent um, uh, disturbance and excretion of fetal matter, fetal matter and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's quite a different mechanism. And it be so, so we're talking about an event that takes place Perhaps twenty five or thirty every th twenty five or thirty years. Yeah, but as a the very, forestry. very um, significant event in terms of uh, typically in terms of seven. So I think the difference can be summed up as a risk and approach to risk. Um, so there's a higher risk from forestry sediment than there is from stock in terms of your setback. So that's mm -hmm. the that's the difference. So there's no um, like many of these things, as Tom said, there's diminishing returns in terms of your setbacks. There's no magic number that makes everything good or bad um, but these are numbers that we think reduce the risk to a to a level that's acceptable in terms of water quality yeah. oh, so you, can thank I, you can I continue i've just got a, a couple more here question um the option two emerging plantation forestry with carbon forestry was a, that puzzles me because um i'm i think that the rules around carbon forestry should be more stringent um, than plantation forestry. There's more management within plantation forestry than there is within carbon forestry. So what's the, what is the thinking behind merging these two rules? These rules were initially separated because the previous National Environmental Standard did not deal with carbon forestry at all. So there was a separate rule regime for, <coughs> that we drafted for the carbon forestry. Now that the National Environmental Standard deals with both of them, uh, we have uh, looked at the option of bringing that together to put them under the same framework. They would both be subject, um, if it's greater than 10 hectares, which most carbon forestry is, uh, to a restricted discretionary activity resource consent. Um, and if there are additional risks, they can be managed through that process. Okay. So you're actually Im you're imposing more more rules on carbon forestry by doing this. That's what you're saying, is it? Uh, it? No. What we drafted initially had a separate rule framework for carbon forestry, and that very similar kind of framework is what we would suggest is carries on. Um, even though it's merged, it would still be um, a very similar level of protection and risk management. And that direction was from council that you wanted a different approach for carbon forestry yeah, yeah. to plantation forestry. So that was why there were two. Uh, the national legislation came in. Um, now we're saying that one of the options um, is that you could merge them. Yeah. And just for clarification again, then under option two, what setbacks are we talking about? The setbacks um, for carbon forestry would be less or, or sorry, the setbacks really apply to the harvest time and the time of land disturbance. So if it was uh, carbon forestry and a permanent carbon forestry going in, there wouldn't necessarily be a setback because there wouldn't be that, that future land disturbance element where you require sediment control. So under option two, plantation forestry wouldn't have a setback. So plantation forestry would have a setback. Carbon forestry, uh, we wouldn't have a, sorry, Tom, you also. Carbon forestry, I think might, uh, my reading of this would be carbon forestry might not. Um, uh, so if you get carbon forestry that was exotic, and if the potential to be harvested, you obviously want to manage for some sort of setback. Um, uh, but if you had carbon forestry that was native, then Never planned to be harvested in any way. You uh, wouldn't have a Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move on. Just, uh, just around your um, first one, come around the, the 20 metres as a report referred to in the commentary in the Quinn report. So, my place to start. Um, I've got quite a list here. So, um, Andrew, Brian, Kevin, and Kate. Let me start with a question for. Top minutes to do with the Quinn report and it's connected to Tim's question. Um, are there other aspects? Uh, Point, Richard. 
are there other aspects of the width of the setback that influence the environmental outcomes, i.e. Uh, soil type um, slope that's not just associated with the length of setback? Those, those variables are really important. Um, yeah. uh, although difficult to write, those variables are variables mm -hmm. difficult to account for within the rules. Um, so I think that the buffers we're talking about here account for some variability um, with slope band soil type. Thank you. I'll, I'll go back to the screen. Um, Matthew, your fourth bullet point, you've got unintended consequences of setbacks. Um, I'm just wondering why, because uh, it was raised through the submissions about um, deforestation uh, associated with the current rules and also with the ETS rules, if you um, deforest, uh, let's say you've got a plantation, existing plantation, and you remove it, then you uh, move to the to the new regime uh, to a 20 metre setback. So you've got a strip of land that you can't plant in trees. And under the current regime, I think the um, setback for um, under the NES, I think it's, um, I think it's three metres an under three metre waterway and over a three metre waterway is five metres. But anyway, that additional area where you can't replant would be subject to uh, the deforestation rules, in other words, penalties. So I wondered, unintended consequences, was there any thought around that sort of scenario? I haven't looked at that level of detail about um, the consequences in terms of that deforestation. The, there's two things I can um, suggest. One is that if that was replanted in native species that would reach minimum canopy height of five meters, um, it's my understanding that that would still be in, that would qualify as replanting. Yep. Uh, the second thing is that although the setback is reduced, uh, we're also suggesting that it be um, limited to a smaller range of water bodies. So it would not re result in the more extensive deforestation that uh, was uh, reaching a level of concern before. So the, I understand the current rules with deforestation, you've got to replant with a forestry species. So once again, the unintended consequences here. So in other words, I don't think you can freely plant natives under the current rules with deforestation. So I, I would just nervous about heading down a pathway where we could create a real headache and a liability for us potentially as an organisation. Thank you. I will look into that and it's something we can uh, confirm with you on the 14th. Thank you. I did have another question about... Uh, Go to someone else. I'll go around. I'll try and keep it just a couple of questions each, then we'll come back around again. Um, we've got thanks, Andrew, um, Brian, Kevin, Kate, Christian, Kelly. Cool. I'm not sure why some of my questions have already been asked, but it's a matter of interest. Does that mean I can plant a tree right at 20 metres, bearing in mind that you know you have the trunk of the tree and then the overarching of the tree? I mean, and if it's a permanent uh uh, carbon forestry, the tree could get quite big over, you know, over a period of time. Like, um, I'd be interested to know, how, you know, what that shadow actually is for um, those types of trees. So what, what's the thinking with that? Am I going to get the spade out at 20 metres? Or is it going to be a further, you know, if there was a fence there, for example. So what's the thinking? Yes, they could plant at 20 metres. The setback is 20 metres, not 20.2 or 4 or 6, it's 20. Yeah, and okay. And so so I'm assuming every commercial forester would make their own decision based on... Yeah, so it was a matter of interest. Forestry. So when, when you make that statement, what is the expected shadow of, of that tree? You know, like, is it going over the waterway? I, well, the rule is around uh, managing sediment discharge to water as opposed to shading. Um, I don't know that we've actively thought... That shading, but potentially yeah. could. I think it would cover shading because part of the reason, one of the yeah. reasons for the 50 meters was so that if it fell down, it wouldn't end up 
Yeah, I, I just make that point anyway. You can scribble that one down. Consideration. No, um, second one of your things. Um, I like Kate's point, by the way, the opportunity for native plants, you know, and maybe step back. And just quickly, if, 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 if you would, the, the rationale behind restricted discretionary controlled activity and the discretionary, just quickly, the differentiation there. Certainly, restricted discretionary uh, limits the range of things that council can take account of, uh, but that consent can be declined. Yes. A controlled activity for harvesting, council must grant a controlled activity consent, but can impose conditions and restrictions on it. Yeah. And then both of those things would have some, um, some conditions, some standards, and if those conditions or standards weren't complied with, it would go to a full discretionary activity, which everything's on the table to consider and council can grant or decline it. Thank you very much. So those two rule frameworks provide clarity for both claim users and consent staff. So everybody knows what, what the things are that we uh, want to look at in both of those control and RDAs. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Uh, Kevin? Um, yeah, we have just had a re uh, a reconsultation and revamp of the NES commercial forestry. Um, and within that, there is the rules around deforestation, there is rules around replanting and the earthworks, and there's and we have to supply a harvest plan and how we're going to do that. So I assume that we will be the ORC will be monitoring those in our far in our forestry management program that we normally do. So we'll be monitoring all that like we normally do. Yep. Yeah. So uh, if you know, I'm just I'm probably if the NESFCF has just been completed and done, and their rules are in there, and that is after extensive consultation and extensive scientific backing, uh, I'm just struggling to see why we would need to go uh, any any tougher than what those national standards apply other than to ensure that we are actually doing the monitoring and doing the, the work to ensure that those conditions are, are enforced. So, so council's direction was for additional controls over forestry and um, for the carbon forestry because of the impacts on water quality. And as Tom mentioned, that it's a, almost a benign activity for 25 years and then it has a an impact um, during that harvest and deforestation uh, cycle. It's your decision to make. So we've provided you options that align with the council direction that you provided previously. Um, that's still what we're doing today. Um, and it's your um, decision ultimately when the plan's notified next year as to whether or not that's um, that's what you want to do. You good there, Kevin? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, Dean, Gretchen, then Elliot. So, so um, and thank you, Andrew, for your question to Tom, which sort of covered some of my points. But I just want to check where farm plans and forestry plans sit, because as you, you've mentioned them in the paper, but it doesn't appear. So, and so that's the first part of my question. Are you seeing them as a way through or not? Um, farm plans. Uh, by the way that those uh, regulations are drafted, they don't apply to, to forestry and certainly a, a, a standalone forestry um, enterprise would not normally uh, be going through the farm plan type process. No. The NES for uh, commercial forestry does have uh, forestry plans as a uh, set out in them. And it would be my suggestion that they are relied on significantly as part of that uh, particularly that controlled activity consent uh, process to rely and to um, just reinforce those harvest plans. The harvest plans, as they're written in the uh, NES for commercial forestry, have a, quite a lot of discretion in them um, to the extent that uh, some of the outcomes that council's direction previously um, probably inadequate to rely on to achieve that. So the second part of my question is, and it goes to what Tom's response was, that depending on what you do with the setback area, and you could be grazing with sheep, 
or you could have a buffer planting in there will give a very different result and change that curve quite substantially. The question for me is what would the best practice look like and can that be put into a system that in the forestry plans that gives a pathway that makes sense and actually drives better performance and, and, and management. Um, and both ecologically. So part of my question is that we often look at this as one problem sediment. Mm. How do we deal with that? When there's a whole lot of other parts that we should be looking at, not only sequestration of carbon, but also biodiversity values. And if we don't look at all of those curves together, we're not necessarily getting the best results. Mm. Is there any way that we can use a forestry plan to give what would give a really good result and make an easier pathway? Uh, an answer to that. Possibly. In terms of giving an easy pathway. Um, so it won't be easy. It's an easy, yeah. It's, yes, yeah. It, it might be a more, um, a more lenient or more, uh, it might have some... Uh, Way that we could encourage it in the plan if there was a better outcome. Um, certainly have some initial policy positioning around that at the moment, that sort of roughly drafted up. We could certainly strengthen that and bring that to you as, as, as maybe an option for the full team. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kate. Uh, Gretchen? Um, yeah, just listening to this simple question is what is a setback then? Because um, when you said that it was for harvesting, uh, in that, um, what are they? The carbon forests can have trees right to the edge of the, basically, you could have trees in your area. So therefore, what is the setback? Is it a harvesting setback or is it a planting setback? Um, and then the question is, if you harvested that zone really, really carefully, yeah, what's a setback? I will need to look into the uh, details of that in terms of what's in the existing uh, national environmental standard because we obviously can't go below that yeah, the requirements yeah. in there. And yeah. um, I just don't have it sufficiently clear in my head to give you an answer right yeah. now as to all those different permutations. Um, again, We'll have that clarified for the full team. Yeah, as much as you can after. Um, the other one is um, on the forestry plans versus consenting. Is it a versus consenting, first of all, um, on that option there? Um, or is it um, something else which has been described, which is the harvest plans? But the harvest plans are for harvest, they're not for establishment. So you would want, I'd imagine, to have some conditions at establishment that look at um, how, you know, partic oh, particularly for the smaller operators, because the bigger ones do have a whole lot of certification they do. Um, so how, do, how would that work? How would those two line up? Well, just, um, I think probably this conversation has, has illustrated that this is an idea that we've kind of only just, we wanted to test with you whether you thought we could have this, um, you know, like in, in a, some kind of equivalency. Um, we don't yet know whether that's kind of like how possible it is or what it could cover, but really quite keen to get your views on whether you think that that would work um, work for us. For this situation, it, to me, it seems like a kind of a useful way of um, achieving some of the same outcomes that we're expecting freshwater farm plans to have, but in this other sector, which you know equally has um, some some activities, but you know, like big players that should could be able to provide this type of um, thinking and nuancing for the particular circumstances. So, no. yeah, okay. I don't know. One more just quickly is on water yield, because that's one of the things that's in the restricted discretionary. Um, how easy would it be to assess in a consent the impacts on water yield when um, green infrastructure example, taking out peak flood flows versus um, 
sucking up water and there's a whole range of different natural sucking up of waters that happen from trees as well as um, you know if you've got um, pasture then you've got quicker runoff during flood flows as well so what how would we assess water yield and I know this was a direction of council too and it's yeah mm. practically would it be easy water yield is um, assessment of that is used in a, diff a number of different uh, regions across the country so oh, yeah. there are methods by which it can be done however I also advise that um, we have been uh, approached with some research that Scion, the forest research organization is undertaking right at the moment uh, the, the results of that are starting to come through but have not yet been published and we've been asked if we would um, attend to be involved in a briefing about those outcomes um, which is specifically on water yield so that's happening next week at the stage it's just oh, been yeah. offered um, which will inform a little bit more about the, the current science on that because yeah. most of the science that we have dates back several decades yeah. thank you thank you Gretchen um, we have Elliot and Alexa yeah I was wondering if you could um, remind us what um, so under change one it's talking about other waterways ephemeral streams and stuff being treated as critical source areas potentially just wondering if you could remind us like what that means in terms of a setback or anything like that so for those smaller streams we would rely on any setback um, and any management in a forestry plan but we would treat them as uh, those smaller ephemeral uh, streams and gullies as uh, critical source areas similar treatment as to what they are in, in more farming situations and would be looking to those forestry plans to reduce the sediment in the way that's best for that particular piece of land so be like case of case by case but yes that's correct Really? Thank you, Elliot. Uh, Alex, and then I've got coming round again. Uh, this might be a silly question, but I'm just wondering where we have setbacks. Are there any rules for what happens in setbacks? Anything to incentivize um, the sort of planting that is helpful as opposed to um, weeds growing in setbacks? At this stage, we haven't. Uh, got anything concrete there but um, in response to a, a question um, earlier I've suggested that we can come back with an option about that for the 14th on the 14th um, because I think it is um, it is a useful thing that if it can be encouraged um, then and the, the council wants to encourage it then certainly that can be put into the plan it just seems that there might be some important things and kate i didn't get that from what you said but that's okay that's just me i'm um, thinking about the um a lot of the argument from the forestry industry is about um uh, the um advantages the co-benefit of forestry shading things and so on well that's only true as long as things aren't harvested as soon as it's harvested it's no longer true and there's huge disruption to those streams but yeah that, and there's um, a couple of other things in the forestry arguments that probably would be um, be able to be put aside, possibly not from their perspective, but from ours in terms of the best outcomes for water. See those on the front end. Thanks. Thank you, Alexa. We had a question to start with. Um, Kerry, we've got something to say before we go second round. Yeah, I do have a question, but if there are others that are on the list, they can go first. We're going around again. You're happy? Okay, so I've got a... When do you go now with your question? Then? Okay. Um, so just to, am I hearing correctly that within the setback, trees <coughs> actually would be as effective as anything else? So if, if you're planting a forest, you can plant forestry trees in that setback and they would achieve the same as any other planting. So then if you harvest, when you get to harvest, we're talking 25, 30 years down the track, and not harvest a area of the setback, whatever length that might be, whatever distance that might be, 
you would actually leave a buffer that was trees anyway. It's, it's my understanding, and um, Tom can correct me if I'm wrong, but a densely planted um, and probably not in, in you know, individual very large trees, but more of a densely planted buffer is far more effective for managing sediment runoff. Um, so what you have described, um, just leaving forestry trees there, um, ties in a little bit with this earlier discussion of, of possibly having a more direction as to what occurs in those, in those setbacks. Um, because I think that would be more effective for managing sediment runoff. But if the concern is slash in after harvest and then that growing period before the trees are established to a certain extent, and then basically it's a safe environmental practice through to the next harvest, then um, how effective would actual trees not harvested be in retaining slash as opposed to much lower, much smaller um, native plantings, say? Tom. Um, so this is again uh, a lot like the continuum discussion we had before about setbacks and distances and stuff. Um, uh, you'll get better results, uh, as Matthew was outlining before, uh, if your uh, setback area is um, uh, populated with um, undergrowth and other plants that can help to intercept sediment runoff and other bits and pieces. Um, Pondries aren't that great. Um, you typically end up with a um, uh, for a bare uh, sub canopy area. Um, the but you still get a you'll still get a level of benefit not having significant disturbance within that twenty meter setback area as described. Um, and so you know uh, again, the what we were talking about low end um, uh, or high risk. Um, high risk would be. <coughs> Figures, harvesting equipment, um, other bits and pieces in that 20 metre buffer. Uh, if that activity was occurring outside of that 20 metre buffer, your risk reduces. Um, your risk reduces further if you have um, uh, uh, a uh, uh, level of biodiversity and plant type in that 20 metre buffer area that is better at uh, capturing sediment and other bits of run. So it's a, again, it's just a continuum. Um, and I think based on the discussion we've had so far, it's probably a bit of work for us to do in terms of clarifying what that setback looks like. Um, I'll add a minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, Gary Mandy, you've got Kevin, Tim, Brian. Uh, under the new NESF, NSCF, there is, there's now requirements, the greater requirements for slash management. Uh, but what of interest, what you just said before about the harvest plan, you thought that that was quite difficult to enforce and to monitor. Uh, so when we get a when we get a harvest plan, um, how do we critique that? Because to me, that seems to be the key to the whole part is that the forest manager, the, the harvest plan, would give us. Um, that would be the time to say, well, no, you need to have these barriers built or these buns or whatever built to ensure that slash doesn't. Yeah. Joe, Joe yeah, so we can only do what is around the permitted activity standards with those um, harvest plans. And they are, uh, my understanding is that they are supplied on written request from us. So we're not always gonna be getting those harvest plans. Um, and in terms of the mechanism, why the things that those harvest plants can then require, that is set out what is in the regulation. So beyond that, we can't ask, we'll do any more under our current rule framework. So uh, we can look at them. We do, um, as the councils will have heard at our presentation or workshop on forestry, um, it is a, a small team and is doing great work, um, but it is one of those risk-based activities that we've, how we monitor through our compliance program as well. Thank you, Kerry. Yeah. We'll carry on then to Tim. Yeah, um, just want to focus again on the um, option two, um, where it has been explained that um, if it's carbon forestry, there may be no setbacks. Now, carbon forestry at the moment is between 90 to 100% radiata or Douglas fir. 
there's very little carbon forestry going in in um, native forest. And because it, the reason for that is it grows so slowly. The whole purpose for for investing in carbon forestry is to get ETUs, and you trade ETUs. It's 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 a financial arrangement pretty much, which has got a, a an offset for the environment. Um, so I just see loopholes appearing here. Um, and so I'm, I'm questioning your definition of what carbon forestry actually is in terms of a species. Yes, so can I just say that NESCF defines commercial forestry as exotic continuous cover forestry or plantation forestry. So that's the definition that we use. But in our original drafting, we didn't differentiate between, well, we did, sorry, but we included native Natives. in our carbon forestry. So that's kind of part of what we need to look at is- So you're gonna need a separate rule for um, exotic as opposed to native, because first of all, I, I see no reason to allow, I mean, natives can, can grow and naturally grow to the waterway. Mm. Um, but if, if you, if you if you in your carbon forestry you've got Radio and Douglas fir, um, then it can grow all the way to the waterway too if you are allowed under these rules. So, so if council gives us direction, then we can draft something that looks like that. Well, I'm just thinking back, and we were talking about setbacks before. I mean, I think that's where it sits. And if we want a sort of intermediary between a 20 meter and a nothing, um, it's shorter than 20 meters. Sorry, can I just um, get some clarification, uh, Tim, as well? Because on the on that uh, change too, basically, well, my interpretation, and if I'm wrong, can you let me know, is that the new NES um, uh, uh, commercial forestry or production forestry includes this for exotic tree species, mm -hmm. doesn't refer to indigenous tree species, so they'd be outside. So what we're so my understanding is that we're saying that we should treat all exotic forestry the same in regards to setbacks, et cetera. That's my understanding. Broadly, except for, as Matthew qualified, the setback issue potentially is different with the carbon, but 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 you're right, the NSCF applies to exotics. Thank you. Are you good there, Tim? Yeah. Thank you. Um, who's next? Me. Oh, that's Brian. That's Brian. Cool. If if I plant natives and covenant it, um, I'm assuming it'll be forever. You know, it's an organic thing. Some trees will fall down and some will grow and all this type of thing. So my question is, is carbon forestry the same thing? Is it really forever? Um, for example, if I have uh, carbon forestry and I paid back the carbon credits, what's stopping me from cutting it down? So the benefit of option three is that if you decide to harvest at some point, then we have an ability to have some oversight to manage sediment discharge mm -hmm. at that point in time. Yeah, so, yeah, but, but we, you, you, you say that though, you say that, but we may, you know, depending on how it all goes, have planted the carbon forestry right to the side of the stream. And I think the evidence is saying is that, you know, even if you left the trees in beside the stream, that that's not a particularly efficient setback arrangement. But the controlled activity would allow you to manage that adequately at the harvest mm -hmm. time, as long as one of the controls is around setbacks and harvesting, and, and setbacks and sediment, yeah. then you would but, be able to control that. Yeah, possibly. But, I, you know, option two, and, you know, this is around this question, mm -hmm. is, you know, I my sense is, they're not, I'm not an expert in it, but, but, you know, there are benefits in considering them under the same same but different sort of role so that all these contingencies inevitably will happen because at some point carbon forestry will become plantation forestry even if you don't get any money out of it. Could be wrong. Yep. Commodity well, changes. Mm. Sorry? Commodity changes. Yeah. So the reason we have separated out is to make sure that if a carbon forest in the future does become a plantation forest, we've got some ability to control it, but they don't have to be separated out. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. what, what I'm hearing also is that the setback management, uh, I'm hearing that some increased emphasis on uh, thinking into the future about long-term management of that, particularly with uh, natives, if at all possible, um, and 
thinking about that both in terms of uh, carbon forestry and plantation forestry um, so that should there be future change um, there isn't a future problem sitting there thank you i have um Kate and sorry just one of the other questions and i raised it earlier but in the report on forestry i wasn't quite sure if it's going to end up with any rules. And that is climate change. We've got uh, fire risks will get worse. Understanding fire management, I require, I understand it's required in the, was in the plantation forestry rules. I presume it's in the commercial forestry rules, yep. but whether given our climate, we're having anything more specific in there, including water storage for putting it out, but also managing it. it yeah, I mean, we. It doesn't, anyone watching the news in the last three years, member from Moraki certainly <coughs> highlighting um, their Oha situation. They're, they're really big risks. Got anybody to take along? One of the challenges with fire risk is it's not our responsibility. Mm. Um, and so uh, we can manage in terms of water quality, but um, it's not, doesn't really fall within our jurisdiction. So uh, we're challenged in terms of what we can what we can do in that space. Um, we have, thanks, thanks Kate, we have Andrew then. Yeah, I just want to go back to um, the 20 metre setback proposed. And if a forester was replanting a block, you know, the trees have been harvested and want to replant the block, what would happen with any proposed setback that is currently greater than what's in the NES CF. So would, would they have to comply with a setback in our rules over and above what's in the National Environmental Standards yeah, CF? So that, that the NES allows stringency for water quality purposes, and that's the intent of these rules, as they are more stringent than the so, water quality purposes. So yes, they would so, comply with the more stringent. So there's so there's no such thing as existing use rights no. in terms of. So so once again, there's another scenario with um, your exposure to um, deforestation. The rules around deforestation don't don't give you the option to plant natives. You've got to replant with exotic forest species. So I'm just highlighting that mm -hmm. as well. I think as well, it's worth remembering that this is to go through the restricted discretionary pathway. If people do want to plant within the setbacks, they can still apply for a consent. So it's not like a, you know, this isn't, there's no planting within 20 metres. Just, yeah. And they may have other more effective ways to manage the sediment loss mm. um, through some small detention systems and wetlands. Or, but there's just ideas, but mm. they may have other ways of dealing with it, um, which can be assessed through that process. Mm. Thank you. Um, I've got three questions. Um, first one is oh, really sorry. First, the first one was around um, is around planting time. We don't seem to have anything here around planting time. So one of my concerns is around um, planting through around over biodiversity areas. Now, I, I, just correct me, but I think that may in, uh, under, that comes through the the NES CF, which is a minute, would be administered by the TAs. Is that correct? Probably the thing that gets that I get about the most is blanket spraying pre-planting and um, reckless use of the spraying wand and planting you know, right into right into areas like they plant around the manuka but the manuka's got no chance <laughs> 10 years later. Is, is there any way the the NES framework is still reasonably permissive um, and we can only control aspects relating to water quality and quantity uh, under the NPS. So we, we are limited in terms of what we can do. And the TAs are the same in terms mm -hmm. of their abilities to manage activities are also constrained by, by the NES. And there's only a handful of circumstances where we can introduce stringency across both organisations. Yeah. 
both um, sets of regulators. So that probably and implies reason. that uh, it is a specific element of the afforestation and earthworks plans that are required under the NES um, CF. Um, is that um, significant natural areas and um, high biodiversity value areas, the protection of them. Um, but it's under that forestry plan framework that um, we get on request under those provisions. Yeah, thank you. The other one, my next question was around uh, with the application of anything that we would introduce around 10 hectares or greater. Has there been any discussion about that level 10 hectares is like um, bringing in like rules for you know, smaller areas, um, as in smaller farm forestry plots and maybe around that. Has there been any, you know, any discussion or any reason for that 10 hectares? Other than, we always talked about 20 hectares. I thought that's what it was last time. In the feedback, there was not a lot of feedback about that specific size. It was more about whether there is a limit at all. <laughs> Um, and a general opposition to consenting at all. Do you say limited opposition to consenting? Yes. Okay. So that probably brings me to my third question, is which is um, down the bottom, which is just, I guess, down further from what you've got there. The options for change three, um, treating forestry plans similar to freshwater mm -hmm. farm plans. So it seems to me that every time we come into this stuff, there's such a diversion of areas and things going on that we're, it seems to me that integral, the actual the, the integral part is to have your plan pre-planting that you follow through, and if you have that plan up front, which basically informs your know, your rest of change three, then it should become pretty straightforward because if you know what needs to be in your plan before you plant, you know what you're going to need to get your um, harvesting consent or whatever further down the line. So I'm, um, so is that that. Is the intention of that one there, it's got, it's got like treating forestry plans similar to freshwater farm plans. Is that like creating, I, as I understand, there's already an existing forestry plans that are required? Would that be tapping into those plans and add, adding? Do you see that you might want to add to those plans mm. some specific requirements we may have above what the TAs would be implementing? Uh, the... National Environmental Standard for uh, Commercial Forestry does have a range of different plans um, that are required to be prepared. Uh, there is no oversight in those by anyone. Council is able to request a copy of them, and that's all. The uh, idea behind what we put forward to you with the two uh, consenting for establishment and consenting for harvesting is that those plans would able to be able to have that oversight and um, confirmation that they were being implemented. Uh, monitoring those kinds of things would be able to occur on those uh, on those plans. So that's the way that we're suggesting that they're treated more like freshwater farm plans and that they actually have a level of oversight. Thank you. And the last one, just following up from a bit of the replanting stuff, so like you, this is what I saw the last bullet point is it's basically says requiring replanting uh, grassing after harvesting so that soils are not left bare. So to me, that reads that after you harvest it, it's a matter of getting it into something as quick as possible to hold the soil, and it doesn't matter if it's grass, tussocks, trees, or whatever. Because that's how I understand it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, So there's no requirement to replace trees mm -hmm. with trees. There may be requirements from the any from the mm -hmm. carbon credit side of it, but I'm more concerned with environmental impacts as opposed to financial mm -hmm. things. So that's correct. So we don't have any more questions? We've had a pretty good... Um... Oh, could I just make a point about the forestry plans? And I just, um, I meant to say this earlier, is that um, it's not something that we've talked to the industry about yet. Um, but if you think that it's kind of got some merit, then that's something that we would want, look to do and kind of work together with the industry for um, through the Clause 3 pre-notification consultation process. So just, just wanted to kind of flag that that's where we're at with that. We haven't, yeah, we haven't yet raised it. Thank you. Oh, I think we've had a pretty good um, round the table um, with questions and understand where we're at. We got any? We got um, some general comments as to what sort of direction we may like to give for the ongoing writing. Thank you, Andrew. 
Um, I'm a firm view that option two is, is the way to go. Um, there's a couple of comments I want to add to that, is that around this table, we've had numerous discussions about the weakness of um, the NES plantation forestry in reference to carbon forestry, because it didn't include it. Um, that is why we asked for greater rules and controls going forward. This was prior to the NES CF, commercial forestry. Um, and in my view, those uh, concerns have been picked up um, through the review of that um, NES um, commercial uh, uh, forestry. Second point I want to make is um, for my sins, um, I do have some forestry and we've been through both processes, um, harvesting processes and also um, replanting processes and also um, establishing new areas of forestry. And just to give you an example, um, a new area of forestry uh, that was established in the last six, 12 months, and we had to give written notice to uh, the ORC on a number of matters. It's about a three page document to fill out um, and it asked questions around setbacks and, and that and obviously there's a setback required under the NES. Um, so you can't plant right to the, to the waterway. Um, we also had to give notice to uh, TA, so Dunedin City Council, um, and things like uh, natural vegetation can't be removed. Um, so once again, we had to give written notice uh, to Dunedin City and, and cover off those, those aspects. Um, I have real concerns, uh, and I've stressed, stressed it already today, about the unintended consequences with deforestation and the liability potentially um, with those forest owners that we could expose them to when they can't establish within that um, setback period of that setback area for to go to 20 metres, which is twice uh, the 10 metre setback as stated in the NESCF. Um, and it's not only an exposure of the liability to those landowners, but I think it's an exposure to organisation as a liability as well. So we, yeah, we need to get it done tomorrow if we're going to go down that other pathway. Thank you, Andrew. Can you just confirm, could you just confirm to me that you know this the stuff that you're doing with the planting, is that for replanting or is that for pre-planting, initial planting as well? We've done both. So you need the same reports for both? Correct. Thank you. Um Kate. Look, um, I'm really couple I just want to say that I think the forestry plans there are people that farm and forest, mm. and it would make a lot more sense. But the other part of this is, and I'm really excited with some of the announcements on Friday, I may be yet disappointed in the reality of it, but um, the idea of a catchment context being more than just the CCCVs that were in the freshwater stuff, and that if I was looking at the risk of forestry, some of it is the a number of forestries doing it all at the same time in a catchment, which it may be okay for one to be harvesting, for example, but the risk is actually often greater if there's three doing it at, at the same time. And I think the catchment context that the farm and the forestry plans could work to um, will give a much better heads up about what, what those risks are. And so I think if we're looking at better outcomes, having the plans working together, both for, and, and, and for those that are doing you know, we've got some wonderful examples of brilliant farm foresters. Um, it makes much more sense to them to be working on the same system or a similar system when the effects are the same. Uh, you're looking at the same risks. If that makes sense. Thank you, Kate. Hi, uh, Bridget. Um, yeah, I guess um, there's a lot we need to look into in terms of um, making sure that we're being efficient and effective and working within the current tools that there are as well, working with um, the certification processes we've already got in place as well as those pre and post um, harvest plans. Um, but I just think as a point, if we were thinking about permitted baseline, then um, on a farm you can plough up vast tracts of land um, 
from time to time, more often than you could harvest a forest. Yeah. And we're not talking about requiring farmers to do native planting and riparian strips and things like that. We do need to have a think about, you know, what's fair um, and also what impact a tree has because a tree is a tree essentially and is it having actually a positive effect on a waterway? Often it is. Um, and yeah, we just, we just need to have a, Think about that. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Tim? Yeah, I tend to support that. Uh, but what I see there with the different options is a bit confusing. I mean, I like to see um, the rules around um, plantation forestry also applying to, for to carbon forestry. That's one. Uh, I'd like to see that also included with a setback um, for exotic. Um, but I agree with Gretchen, a, a, a setback, which is um, across the, the ag sector, like a 10 metre setback might be as far as we go. Um, but at the same time, we also have to recognise the native um, aspect of planting up to a waterway. So there's a, there's a real combination of things there. Well, thank you, Tim. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, cool. I, I like what um, Gretchen and Tim said there. Um, look, from my perspective, we're on a bit of a journey. Uh, you said you're going to be doing some further discussions with forestry and sector. There'll be a formal hearing process. I think we're heading in the right direction with some um, tweaking. I like what people have said about the native, maybe beside the stream. But uh, yeah, I don't like the way we necessarily set these out. We go, op you know, if I look at it, you go, is it option one or is it option two or is it option three? From my perspective, they've all got, you know, they're all in the mix. They're not exclusive. Or, or is that the way it's been set up? My yeah. apologies for that. For this one, uh, definitely these are a little package. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for a number of the other rows that we've got, they are much more Yeah, yeah, one options, or the other. So I apologise for the confusion around Yeah, so them. I think all three have, have mm -hmm. got merit. And I'm not saying that's exactly where we're going to land, but it's where we're heading. Thank you. Um, any other? Hey, Gary. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, 50 metres is far too far. Sector said that's nuts. 20 metres is half and far too far, or just slightly under half and far too far. The sector will probably say that's nuts as well. Um, it's a very professionally managed advanced sector that has been here for a long time using modern technology and major changes, especially in the past 10 to 20 years. Uh, questions have been you know, um, challenging to get answered in any specificity, I suppose, that would help if the forestry sector was sitting watching us, hoping we'd have, to have confidence over what we're all saying. Would they be patting themselves on the back saying, God, those guys are good, or would they be throwing things at the screen? Um, so I think we need to work a bit closer with the sector to be honest, um, to come up with what is actually achievable so we don't end up with them slamming us through the next stages of the process. And uh, we have to come up with something that'll work. And I'm not sure that what's up there as those options would work. I like the potential concept of we're gonna have freshwater farm plans and we're heading in that direction whether a freshwater uh, forestry plan can achieve all we're trying to achieve and leave them a limited baseline. So that's my feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. No. I've got a technical question. You might have a technical question. No. Um, <laughs> and it sort of goes to Gretchen's point. It's whatever the setbacks, why have we got a definition of riparian um, area, which is different from these setbacks? Because the glossary, and it's one that's, I, I'm just raising now, I was going to raise later on, sometime I want to understand why we've got that um, gloss, the definition in there when we haven't kept to it as a riparian area. Just, yeah. Any other comments? Uh, I'll go um, Kevin and then Edward. Oh, Edward, so yeah, go Edward. I'm just finding a page, sorry. Probably better, better to wait for you, Kevin. I've missed most of the discussion. <laughs> just just going to have a yeah, look. Yeah, you, you have yours then, Kevin. Oh, yeah. Um, 
Look, mine's pretty solid. Uh, we, we've got to merge plantation forestry with carbon forestry rules, uh, and that now there is a uh, NES commercial product which includes the same, so they need to operate as the same, which is really good. And that also, the really good thing about that is it brings in uh, that standard also brings in the firefighting and everything else around that. So uh, it's, it is a really good move. Um, but look, I, I I think there's two parts to it is that our wording should replicate uh, our setbacks and everything should replicate uh, what's in the NESCF. I'm, I'm more than comfortable with that. I think the real issue is, and the carbon forestry fire in the Waitaki for three, four years ago, uh, absolutely highlighted it to me, and there's no reflection on our staff, but uh, the Waitaki District Council put out a planting plan. Uh, they had various setbacks. They had, uh, you couldn't plant in critical source areas, you couldn't plant in waterways. And when we went up and inspected the remnants of that fire, there was trees planted in waterways, there's trees planted in critical source areas. There was no setbacks, there was no nothing done. So had all those been in place, uh, that would have been a completely different picture. And had also uh, the rules, the carbon forestry being under the same rules as plantation forestry, they would have had firefighting, uh, firefighting tracks and access all available and water available, which is part of the... Um, so I, I just think we have got to, we have got to gear up to ensure that we are actually um, inspecting and ensuring that these people are following uh, following the rules. And I just don't think we... Yeah. yeah. I, I might just respond, Kevin. I, I think the, the team in compliance do an amazing job with, yep, with yep. forestry and our, our resources and do what they can do within the current rules in terms of the national environmental standards. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. No, I'm yeah. absolutely not knocking our team, yeah. but I think, that's, I think that's the hole in the... Uh, certainly with the territory authorities. And so I, I'm yeah, pretty damn comfortable with the work that's been done and being part of some of that review process on the NESCF. I'm, you know, I, would, I would think our, we combine number two and then we go with what's in the standards and make sure we enforce it. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Edward? Yeah, apologies for missing uh, quite a bit of the discussion, but having read the forestry paper and the table and uh, been observing quite a lot of public commentary from forestry companies around the issues they saw, I, and, and knowing that the, the uh, suggested solutions up here are a mix of all, but some of the um, changes proposed, I, I think the red direction of travel is... Um, I'm comfortable with. I have trees myself and I've done a rot rotation, but uh, in the days when I didn't have to do a plan, so it's something new to me. But, uh, yeah. oh, thank you, Edward. Anybody else? I think we got a bit of a sense of direction coming along, probably personally for myself. I'm, I think we're pretty, there's a pretty solid um, consensus around the. Sorry, we. <laughs> there. <laughs> I know, there's, a, there's some skidding going on about three o'clock this morning just out there just quietly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, we, to, we treat exotics the same, be they plantation or um, <coughs> um, production, I mean, carbon or production forestry or intended carbon or production forestry. I um I because things I'm I think we really need to tap into the make sure that we're using the planning the farm or forestry farm planning process to its best advantage because at the end of the day a good plan and I th and I think it's probably important for us to get the plan early so we know what it, the individual plans are so we can actually monitor them and and know where the plantings are going um, because it's just following up on what Kevin was saying. You know, there's some, there's some damn, there's some really well managed forestries out there, and there's some that are not so well managed, and so we need to be able to work with the not so not well managed ones without getting overly, you know, uh, uh, overly um, restrictive on the well managed ones. So it's really a matter of getting the good the poorer ones up to speed, 
and um, and working in that sort of direction. Uh, regarding setbacks, um, I don't know. Um, I think we need to have a setback of some sort just so the egg got some protection because of, and I think it needs to be better than what it was. I think it lost five metres, but it must have gone to 10, I think, in the new legislation, is it? But, yeah. but we need to have some, we need to have setbacks. We've got to have them like, it's, ex, it's not setbacks from the middle, it's setbacks from the wet and critical source type here. And I think if we can just get those um, forests planted in a responsible manner, then everything will fall into line after that. So I think that's my feedback. So that's excellent. Well done, guys. It's um we're one minute early for um smoke No, you're starting no, no, this is smoke minutes late. Smoke over the minute. We've got one minute. Oh, sorry, we're starting one minute. So we'll just have a few minutes for a quick cover. And um we'll we will we will we'll start again at 22. Can we invite the public to Awesome, we're live. You, you start. The meeting's in progress, guys. Freshwater farm plans. Um, just wanted to highlight at the beginning here before getting into the discussion on it that freshwater farm plans, this row. In the table, although it's a, a separate row, this is interrelated to a bunch of different things that we'll be discussing uh, throughout the day. Um, and just uh, when we're discussing this item, thinking about other rows, um, like some setbacks, for is a good example. Uh, and then also, once we've had the other discussions, it might be worth just reconfirming where we've landed on this uh, freshwater farm plan section. So just to refresh you on the draft provisions on freshwater farm plans, they were focused on meeting a range of, uh, setting out in the plan a range of environmental outcomes, which you could meet uh, through your freshwater farm plans. Um, certifying freshwater farm plans was not used as an alternative to resource consents. So there's no sort of alternative pathways that sometimes referred to through the rules that were, dra that were drafted from the plan. And there were also, in addition to what the regulations required, there are also some additional uh, information types required to be submitted to council. Feedback. Um, it was quite strong towards wider use of freshwater farm plans for a range of activities. Um, there was concern about some of the information that uh, was being requested in the, the draft provisions. And there was quite a lot of emphasis on relying on them instead of rules or as an alternative to consent. I've given you some options there. One is essentially to maintain the, the draft framework that we had. The second is to add freshwater farm plans as an alternative to a number of permitted activity standards. For example, um, setback requirements for stock exclusion that may be able to be certified uh, by a certifier that some other arrangement, uh, lesser distances in some pla places and greater distances in others might achieve effectively the same outcome. And that might be a way around uh, getting a resource consent would be to have that certified in a farm plan. In the, the staff opinion, there are some provisions that possibly are not suitable to 
have an alternative of, of a freshwater farm plan approach. And that's particularly if reductions and contaminant losses beyond what might be able to be achieved through good management practices are required. Um, but your option three is there is that you could rely on freshwater farm plans to do that as well, but that is a, in our view, a riskier uh, pathway. In all of this, uh, we have suggested that there needs to be in the plan if if these freshwater plant, farm plans are going to be used as that alternative pathway to getting a resource consent, then there needs to be a, a structured process around that so that uh, there's some, some certainty for um, all parties. Thank you, Matthew. Um, questions? We have... Okay, good. Um, I presume at the moment, say, water allocation would be one that could be in, or that would be in farm plans at the moment, but it could in, in time, potentially. Just what other, yeah, I, I mean, I like, I, I believe in water farm plans as being a really good alternative pathway for a wide number of things. What are, it'd be almost easier to say, what are the other ones that you wouldn't see going in there? But I think we need to have some certainty about what you wouldn't have in there? Um, there are a few things that, in my view, uh, you couldn't have the, in, in a freshwater farm plan. And that one of the first things would be anything that's off site. So a freshwater farm plan applies to a property. So if there was something that was occurring adjacent to it, whether it's, for example, a water tape, um, possibly couldn't be managed through a freshwater farm plan, which applied only to a, a property, or a gravel extraction from a nearby river, something like that, I think. Uh, so it's got to be something that's occurring within the property. If it's gravel criteria. extraction in the river, it's sorry, in the, on the property, where it isn't a Lynn's stream, or if, if, if the stream is in the property, would it be included? That might be a possibility, but I'm just sort of setting out some yeah. some some parameters for some things that, uh, in response to your question, mm. the second thing is that, by my understanding, freshwater farm plans are strongly oriented towards uh, good management practices and improving on farm performance. So, if there are things that are going to be required through the plan that go beyond that, whether it's specific uh, reductions in nutrient losses, for example, um, if they're beyond good management practice, good management practice plus might be difficult to achieve uh, through a certification process. Thank you, um, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have observed some of the, the RPS proceedings and it seems to be, this relates to uh, for sure farm things. There seems to be some reservations uh, in that process around how effective environmental plans have been around the country. Um, with the legislation that sits around freshwater farm plans, um, do you feel that the, um, the obligation and the regulatory um, framework that um, gives a clear direction around what needs to happen through a farm plan as an improvement to what the environmental plans were based on which were voluntary. Do you think it's an improvement in terms of the use of freshwater farm plans? Because it, why I ask this question? Because I think it's really important. You just touched on it about the things that wouldn't be suitable to be in a farm plan, freshwater farm plan, and I agree with that. But is there a degree of confidence going forward that these freshwater farm plans um, are framed up in a way that will get the outcomes sought um, by the legislation. I can have a go at this if you want. Give yeah. a little, <laughs> little bit of background. So yes, um, and and because it is a regulatory framework, um, then it gives the council who is responsible for implementing it the ability to step in where. Um, actions that have been put forward 
um, are then not carried out. And the, the basis of those actions is, is an independent certifier who, who is qualified to make that assessment on water quality matters. So I think there is a lot more rigour than, and that's not to say the voluntary weren't, weren't a good step because there's a lot of good things that have come out of those voluntary programmes, but the added level of rigour around um, independent, um, an independent assessment um, the direction given by council based on science in terms of what attributes should be targeted and then the ability to take enforcement action where those things are not undertaken as they were signed off um, gives it a level of rigour that should achieve better results than, than, an, um, than a voluntary system may have. Cool, cool. And to follow on for a question around the way the legislation is framed up about a freshwater farm plan must have regard to uh, the catchment context challenges values. So it must have regard to it. So it's not a voluntary, uh, you know, give it some consideration. So just to be clear, the words are must have regard to, you know, rather than <coughs> give it consideration. Have I got on the right track? Mm -hmm. So just to be clear in terms of RMA, it give effect to is mm -hmm. top, regard to is next, consider. So there are, there are different tiers have regard to is not the same as give effect to. I'm uh, not sure sorry, exactly I'm, what the wording he says. So the, is, the, the wording is, if it must identify risks and actions, it must have regard to catchment context challenges. Mm -hmm. so yeah. second. second. Oh, sorry, second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Kevin? Yeah, uh, so just around uh, the good management practices, what you were saying that you're a wee bit worried of something needed, um, a greater level of management than just than what we have down as GM ones and, and the likes. Um, it, is it not right though that uh, the actions again, the actions that are certified and audited, the actions must be must be um, going towards the target attribute states of that catchment. So, so, so and to, well, I'll stand to that. And, and so to get to a target attribute state, if it was a heavily degraded river that needed actions greater than GM's, uh, general management, um, would they not have to be included? Otherwise, it wouldn't get certified. Yeah, I think that the challenge is that an, an action, you know, the scale of actions required if you start talking about in, in tens, intensity of use is it's very difficult to capture that in a catchment context and then translate that into an action in a farm plan so there i think there is a there is a level at which it would be more appropriate to undertake a full assessment through a, say, a consent process than than deal with a certifier in terms of an independent action based around management practices so it's i think it's one that most councils are um, as, the, as we move through to implementation of farm plans and development of catchment context, are so just thinking around how they set out some of those um, factors which must be taken into account when actions are, de uh, actions are developed by the farm plan preparer. Um, so it probably doesn't answer your question directly, Kevin, but my sense through development of the legislation with the ministry um, and with the various people that were involved in giving feedback is that they didn't see them as a tool to manage some of those higher order issues. Um, that's that's that was the conversation around the table at the time. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, that's certainly not what's being portrayed now. Uh, you know, I, yeah, yeah, because you're you're sort of picking winners. Um, like we're we're looking my farm plan, um, which I won't be doing one. Um, uh, is I've got to have actions in there that that is showing that I am going to my target attribute states of my river. So if I'm not doing that, therefore, if I'm not going to achieve that by those actions, therefore, why would that, why would that be, what, what, what's the certifier doing that? I mean, that's that's their whole, that, that's the point of having the certifier there. It's not my plan. It's actually, well, it is my plan, but it, it's actually certified that that is actually going to achieve the goals of that, of that catchment. So I think one of the challenges we have is uh, we know GMPs and GMP plus and plus plus and whatever uh, give us direction of travel, but they don't necessarily, we don't know how far they'll take us. And that's been some of the consistent messaging from us. So I, I hear your point that the actions, like there's no point um, having a whole lot of actions that address phosphorus if your issues E. coli. You, you want um, actions that address E. coli because that's your 
you know, issue and whatever your catchment is. So the certifier will be looking for those types of actions, but it's not necessarily saying that that means you'll necessarily get to where you're going, you'll go in the right direction. Um, but whether you get there might be a different, you know, different question. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so these certifiers that are being nationally trained, mm -hmm. um, I'm not just going to put the same, but I, I, I mean that, that are being nationally trained and this is around freshwater management, freshwater improvement, surely that is the whole point of, you know, what, so otherwise why do they come along the farm? So the absolute point is, is this action going to reduce whatever contaminant of concern I have, yes or no? Yeah. If it's yes, that's great. But that doesn't, again, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that we'll get there. Our modelling has shown that the GMP plus takes us some way, but we've always been really clear that we need to go more. And so the freshwater farm plans are a really important first step, um, but they won't necessarily deliver us the end results, whatever the end destination looks like. Right. So, so and then if because if you look at uh, what you've got written here under um, two and three, and add, add a structured process for freshwater farm plan certifiers that sets out what certifiers need to consider and a power to revoke certification if there are material deficiencies in certification. So if we're if we're lining up a plan that that has got to meet my target attribute states, and we're not actually doing that, and and, and I would say uh, again, that is going to evolve over time because most catchments have got uh, between now uh, now so North Otago now uh, we're the twenty fifty to to meet all our target attribute states, and there'll be interim places in between. So I would think that those actions would be heading in that direction. And if we saw, uh, it would be no different to what ORC would be doing uh, on a consent process, that if we saw that those um, weren't meeting the required outcomes, those would be adjusted at certain stages. So I guess an individual farm plan can't uh, can't meet target attribute states, but it can contribute to reductions yep. in contaminants that will overall Make target attribute states. Tom might want to say something that might yeah. stop this thunder, but. Well, yeah, he did. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but what I'd just add is that um, if you had a catchment scale um, predicting what the state of a river might look like in the future is fraught with all kinds of modeling error and other bits and pieces. Um, and so we have a reasonably, we, we can estimate it, we can make predictions, um, but they do come with a, a significant level of error. Um, but, and it is exactly right and that the, the farm planning framework will um, and a certifier will be able to say that those actions are contributing to uh, achieving a target attribute state but they won't be able to um, uh, won't be able to give a level of precision that gets you to a space where you can be confident that you have um, provided the exactly what's required to get to a future target attribute state it's just impossible to do um, so the yeah, I think it's, it's just a bit looser. The, the way that that framework will run will just be a little bit looser than, than what you're talking about. Yeah, but, but uh, so the counter to that is your consent is only based on a property, isn't it? So we, so how, you know, how much better is actually a consent than a freshwater farm plan and that a consent is still only limited to the property. It's not limited to the whole so, catchment. And they're all just about reducing contaminants. That, that's mm. what, whichever model you go with, that's the outcome that we're trying to so achieve, is less contaminants. Sure. Into the the level of assessment under a consent will be far greater yeah. than mm. the level of assessment under a farm plan. Yeah. So so I think that's in terms of the science input and the expertise. Mm. The, the certifiers are not at <coughs> that level. So that, that's the difference. So with those high-risk activities that have a significant um, input from science or, or other expertise um, may, may be better assessed under a consent process because they won't have that level of rigour under the certification process. Yeah, so, so as we develop our freshwater farm plans, uh, sorry to take up your time, Lloyd, but this, I'm probably just doing a wee bit of this at the moment. Um, as, as we develop our freshwater farm plans and they become more catchment specific, and so our, um, our catchment challenges contents and values, which go into all the vulnerabilities and everything that's happening in a, in a particular catchment, uh, surely, uh, and that will be done, that will be informed by our science, yep. so surely that will then inform the certifiers that they will need to change their actions to uh, to sort what's happening in 
there'll, there'll be different risks highlighted that the actions will need to address. Yeah, yeah or, or they will need to. So my, my initial ones of, um, I don't know, let, let's, uh, phosphorus reduction may have to go from one level down to a different level if it's, or it can actually be relaxed once we've got more information on each schedule. Thank you, think, Kevin, the, I think the, um, I think what we're talking about here is um, does fresh fruit of farm plants give you the security that we're comfortable with and in, in moving towards um, you know, enhancing our waterways or do you, or do we think that that's not enough and we need to use consents as opposed to um, understanding that both will be, can change over time and even by the plan gets reviewed. So I think the question is rather than doing barring right down into all the intricacies of the actual freshwater farm plans as they are now, I think that bigger wider question is what uh, what things do we think the freshwater farm plans are a acceptable pathway, and but what things do we think that, uh, will require uh, important enough that we should be putting consents into manage them to a higher degree than what we can with the freshwater farm plan, and we don't you know where that lands farm environment plan through a plan a farm planning system. Does that sound right? So from what you're saying, so we. From your saying, I don't. Do you are you saying that you think that some things may need to be consented because a freshwater farm plan would not be fit for purpose for some things? Or are you saying? No, I'm saying quite the opposite. I'm saying Kevin's, opposite. Kevin's, Kevin's advocating for a much broader scope for freshwater yeah. farm plans. Okay. The, the staff have landed about halfway. Yeah, um, yeah. I think yeah. would be you know more Those more ones. things could be included, but but an element would still remain as a consented yeah. part. Kevin's saying broader. That's so as, yeah, yeah, and, and that's and, and that's 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 actually based on that, that's based on what I'm reading about them, what I'm hearing about them, and what you know the intent of them was, and what the ongoing intent is is about. You know, so, so I do my freshwater farm plan, and I'm and it's to the best of everyone's knowledge at the time. I'm heading to the target attribute states. So I'm working on the very best science and everything that's available at the moment. I've got a certifier that does it. I've got an auditor that does it. I'm working in the right direction. Um, why would I then have to go and get a consent? So the, the whole purpose of freshwater farm plans to get into this was a to make that process correct. It was also make process to stop duplication, and that's why we've gone with the certifier and the auditor to make that happen. And I would think in, in behind is a it's a really strong regional council that's giving science backing to what's happening, certainly ensuring that the, the CCCVs are up to scratch with what's got to be happening. So, you know, I'm, I'm really comfortable to ensure that it's, it's broadened. And I, can I add to that a little bit in that, and what I'm getting from you as well, is that they're living documents, so they're going to be updated, yep. they're going to be continually updated as the CCCVs get more nuanced to individual areas over time so they're going to grow over time yep. and so but that's that, that's good thanks um i'm getting a bit lost sorry i've got brian and if, if your name's not brian can you put your hand up again so i can see you okay so brian you're next cool um you know i i don't disagree with kevin but i disagree i think we're kevin suggesting the line should be because this is a question just because um, I think what Richard's saying is that the consenting process has more rigor and therefore is appropriate for the higher risk activities. I think that's, that's is that what you're saying, Richard? It's my understanding. Of yeah, and I agree with that. And, and I agree with uh, making the most out of farm plans as well, but there'll be some things that'll be excluded. I guess if you wanted an ability to say no to an activity, then a freshwater farm plan is less likely to give you that option versus mm. a consent. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay. Look, um, first part isn't a question, apologies, Lloyd, but the, the premise here is that farm plans are there to deal with the attribute states, and the attribute states are bad because of the land use, which isn't actually necessarily correct and has been proven at times to be incorrect. Um, the question for me for the CEO is long-term plan funding for areas. I mean, for years we've monitored water and we actually haven't done a lot finding out what's wrong with the water. We know that it's not meeting standards and, you know, 66 or 61 that uh, Gretchen just said meet, don't meet one of the attribute states. But we actually don't know the cause of that. Am I correct on that in part? 
in some places. In some places. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we have some information, and, but and, it's... And so I appreciate tomorrow's long-term plan, and I'm going to be raising that as an issue about doing the science behind that. But the other part of it is I can't see the risk matrix here that gives an idea or an, an inclination of where you would do an RMA consent as opposed to a farm plan. And for me, we've done a really bland, and look, I, I'm not blaming you because I think it's a timing issue. Um, we've done, you know, well, dairy, we haven't done quite blandly bright frost, but we, I think there's suggestions that we should. We haven't looked at um, the risk scenarios for certain areas because of their climate. I mean, we've, the cultivation risk is with rainfall, and yet we don't look like we've done that consistently. And so I'm just wondering, if we're going to do an RMA consent as opposed to a farm plan, because I do think farm plans, and I agree with um, the opportunity there, it has to be a risk matrix that drives us to that point um, on the attribute states. And that is where I think we've missed telling that story. Is there a chance or is there an opportunity to do that better or is it just a time factor that we haven't been able to do that? Uh, I can answer that one by saying, yes, there is um, that ability to do a risk type uh, matrix and, and portray that quite visually. We've done part of that already because of the way that we're looking at different issues in each of the FMUs and which responses might be required in different places. So we're, we're part way down that track with the work that we're doing behind the scenes anyway. Right. Um, this... Um, we're having some discussion as we go down through further rows of this table about different activities. And as said earlier, we can test some of these ideas about whether a freshwater farm plan might work for some of those activities or not, um, and what you want to achieve out of it. Um, and I would sum up by saying that this is very much a risk spectrum for this kind of approach. And we're suggesting to you that going towards option three is a is a riskier approach in terms of actually being able to achieve the outcomes that you want to achieve. Um, there is less certainty in there, um, but it is not impossible. We possibly could draft something up that would do it, but it is risky, that's all I'm saying. So the subsequent question to that is, my frustration, and I did do a submission on this, is that the freshwater farm plans, absolutely water is important, but, if I go down to an area like Catlins where biodiversity is equally important and you're just going down, we're not looking at social capital or the resources and what the balance may be to the other risks other than fresh water in an area. I'm presuming from this, but it's a, it is a question. Can the, farm, uh, the freshwater farm plans be used to be more nuanced in areas where the other values are equally at risk and or possibly under more threat? All I can say is, um, I can't answer your question directly. What I can say is that the certification processes and the training processes and things are set up around it being a freshwater farm plan. Um, so whether there are other bolt-on things, it would then be you know, relevant to the capabilities of the people preparing plans and the certifiers as to whether they can deal with those things or not. But at this stage, they are freshwater farm plans and that's what we're playing with. It's very explicit in the legislation yeah. that the risks and adverse effects of farming to be done freshwater or freshwater ecosystems. That, that's the purpose of the, the system. Yeah. You want to do another question? Well, oh, no, I've got yeah. Yeah, I, I think we're absolutely, uh, yeah, we, we're possibly underrating the power of these instruments. We're also possibly underrating where the government, the government will make these stronger. And they will, yeah. The, the, the aim is to and to stop duplication, to ensure that we someone does something right and they're doing it right once and not two or three different times. And look, I, I can see very few activities that need to be outside a freshwater farm plan. Uh, a couple of those might, but it was definitely water takes. No, no problem with that at all, and probably uh, effluent discharges. Uh, and I think the rest we can safely put into a put into a freshwater farm plan because they are heading in the right direction to that that's that's what they have to do um this specific to the soils of the property is specific to the to the freshwater objectives 
and the ecosystems that are subject, they're subject to the community outcomes, the community values. Um, they're identifying all the risks, uh, the impact, they've got to have impact assessments. Uh, so the, and they've got and the, they've got to take um, uh, they've got to consider the existing resources that are uh, resource consents that are already on the property, which will be the water takes and the like. So um, yeah, I look, I would be very reluctant to other than those two that I've mentioned, uh, and I probably in time um, different discharges may even be able to be put in their freshwater plan because they've got to be done. They've got to be done to comply with what's happening in freshwater anyway. But at this stage, it probably is a step too far. But I can't see any other any other ones that would have an issue really. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Tom. Yeah. Um, we'll just stay with. If you've got questions, just for a little bit. Then we'll, we've got a question. Yeah. You know, yeah. Wasn't <laughs> yeah no, oh, I'm, I'm just trying. To, <laughs> I'm trying, trying to, to, so. If there's any more questions, just get them out now. Now's the time uh, to I'm ask. Trying to questions. summarise this discussion in, in order to give me some sort of guidance as to um, what option up there avoids duplication but maintains the best environmental outcome. Uh, that's that's what I'm asking. Which which option is giving us that? We would suggest two, and that using these um, for a range of permitted activity standards, um, but not necessarily situations where uh, more is required in terms of reducing nutrient losses, for example, or if there is a situation where it is something which is an absolute no-go. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Any other uh, questions? Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, we'll just have General Chad and Howell. I had a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, and uh, I, I'm just wondering how that my effluent losses, uh, uh, my um, nutrient losses, can't be uh, sorted out through my freshwater farm plan. I, I just don't, you know, I can certainly do it that way. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to stop effluent losses and dairying, uh, that's, uh, sorry, not, uh, nutrient losses and dairying, I mean, your freshwater farm plan must accommodate that it has to because otherwise you're not going to get to your to your target attribute states and you're not going to be looking after your fresh water so yeah. i just that's the part where you specifically say nutrient losses so i just how won't it stop that what i'm suggesting here is that have a through option two we would have a a rule framework and then if you didn't want to meet some of those standards, you could have a certifier certify an alternative way where you're not going to meet those standards, ah. but you are going to do it in some other way, going to achieve the, the, the same outcome in some other way. Um, so if you're, um, later on when we come to a discussion about um, some of the more intense activities, if you are going to be actively wanting to drive reductions and losses. Um, in my opinion, that needs to come through a rule framework. You can't then have um, a farm plan that says, well, I've got an alternative way of, of not reaching those losses or of, of doing something different um, that a certifier is going to certify. Um, I think that would introduce too much risk. And I, in my opinion, that ought to go through a resource consent framework um, for that wider look at uh, cumulative effects and all those other things that, that the consent process does. So I'm, uh, I'm just explaining. I don't yeah, want yeah, to get into a good, debate yeah, or anything. Yeah, I'm sorry. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. We'll go to Gretchen and then we'll have um, Edward. Is there potential for a lag effect then with the um, farm planning approach so that with the consent you're up front right at the very beginning assessing this is the situation and this is how we're going to deal with it first potentially with the I'm just asking because I might be wrong that um, there'd be risk identification then the risk 
management, then the action plan and the action for farm planning. Um, you yeah, sort of agree on an implementing by a date and what is fair is ra and reasonable is in there as words and all of that would sort of take time versus getting a consent crap. Sorry, there's a question about whether there's some sort of lag effect. That is the system. Yeah. Yeah, so that is the system and with freshwater farm plans is an 18 month period from when they're turned on to someone really needs one. Um, so that is another added time frame into that mm -hmm. system, whereas a consent is that straight away with those conditions and not with that action plan with the time frame. Thank you. Uh, Edward. Yeah, just a question around the certified certifies. What is the, the audit and risk uh, framework? Uh, who do they report to? Uh, so does the cumulative knowledge that they gather yeah. gather somewhere? So um, the certifiers don't generally report to us. They are regional council staff um, and they are accredited at the national level. So it is a very new system where we have far less control over who they are and, and how they are trained. Um, and the, there is some quality assurance stuff there, but again, we have a very limited role in that, whereas consent planners and compliance teams are, are our staff. Uh, Andrew, so this is, uh, are we moved on to? We're moving on. We, yeah, we've mixed up a little bit. So we're moving on now to more yeah. about options. Yeah, I'm, I'm of a view at this point we should be focused on uh, option three. However, I accept that um, there probably needs to be a greater uh, lens across what activities um, wouldn't be suitable to <coughs> in a freshwater farm plan. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see a, a bit more work done there. So I think right at this point, I feel the discussion, um, particularly from the experts around the table, is that I think we need to give this a chance. Um, and I think we need to maximise the potential of a freshwater farm plan. I mean, less regulation going forward um, in, the, in the rural sector is better if we can get the stakeholders, the people on the land, to adopt better practices on a day-to-day -day basis to improve, you know, freshwater outcomes and ecosystems. You know, that, that just makes so much sense. You know, the carrot and the stick approach. Uh, you know, dangle that carrot and um, and keep the stick away for as long as we can. But you know, it comes out when it's really necessary. Uh, Gretchen just mentioned about lag times. Um, we've on a number of occasions heard from Tom and others about lag times when you're dealing with environmental enhancements. And those lag times simply, um, because these sort of things don't change overnight, whether it's 18 months to get a freshwater farm planner, but it might take 10, 15 years to turn around a degradation situation in a freshwater environment. So I think lag times, uh, I don't think that's part of the discussion I, in my view, because I think lag times exist because it's the nature of the business we're in. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Can I just, um, yeah. there's a difference between lag times from what's happening on the land to mm. introducing an additional period of yeah. time that delays the impact mm. of the effect. And I think that's what, especially for a newly establishing yeah. Yeah. activity. So if I get a consent tomorrow, then the actions are in place tomorrow, but our freshwater farm plan rollout is over a couple of years. So and then it's another period of time. So we're delaying actions for a few years is no, the, is the no. point. So can I just make it really, really clear? The lag time I'm referring to is the, the, the scientific um, prediction yep. of an environmental improvement. Yep. Yep. That's what I'm talking about. Yep. So, okay, you get a consent tomorrow yep. and you get a farm environmental plan in 18 months time. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about an environmental improvement over a 15 year period. I mean, that's my point is that 18 months versus 15, 15 years. I'm, just want to make so, yeah, well, I understood that, Andrew. My question was slightly different. It was around the just so we're clear into the direction option three, but um, you're open to, I guess, having some excluded, but would like more evidence, yeah. and you're pushing us as far mm. towards option mm. three as we can get. Yeah, absolutely, okay. I understand the high right. risk activities. Yeah, and I just wanted to make sure we get that. Yeah, but can we can we put to, can we funnel it? So we've yeah. got. I just want to make sure we're clear on that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go on. Look, I understand where Andrew's coming from, but I disagree with them. Um, you know, it's option two. 
you know, and it's about establishing uh, a risk matrix, as Kate has said. Um, we, we don't actually control all the levers. We'll have these certifiers coming out, you know, trained nationally, whatever. Um, and, you know, there'll be a real setting down process. We could lose a lot of time. We could actually have a step backwards. But with the risk matrix, we can actually, um, and, and believe it or not, I actually believe in farm plans, um, but we need to be able to control what we need to control. That's the high risk activities and Kevin's mentioned some of them water take and others you know daring you know where we need to have that ability um, to have a consent and and in the end with our risk matrix we might actually instead of saying all dairy farms it might be just those dairy farms that you know that are in a certain compliance situation but we need to be able to control that we need a certain amount of conservatism you know so let's not pretend that it's open slather option three it's it's option two with the risk matrix and as andrew says you know trying to do as many farm plans as we can because it's a marvelous that we've got that tool but option two thank you um Brian. um yeah. gary thank you gary um <laughs> i'm with andrew as close as possible to option three as we can i think with some actual practical application to the varying issues we'll look to cover, we will find ways to fit them within that one framework. Um, there may be totally open to there being certain circumstances where they will fall outside of that, but if our lens is towards the more we can do in that, that one sector, I think the better. Um, the example raised around water takes that are off property um, I can't think of any that wouldn't be covered by an easement. And I would have thought the expectation of your own farm plan, if you have a water take off property onto another property or in another area, it'll be protected by an easement that you will then look to manage under your farm plan because you have access, you have legal access to that point. Um, it will also fall under someone else's farm plan because that they may encompass it. It'll depend on um, the situation uh, but I'd imagine most land is going to fall under a farm plan of some description. And um, yeah, so I mean, I think this one too, uh, central government seemed very supportive of farm plans and enhancing that process. And I think there will be some national direction that may look to push this further. So thanks, Gary. So you're both the option three and right, um, as much as possible right up to including water takes, yep. what should I say, water take management. So just to be clear, freshwater farm plans are water quality yeah. focused. Yeah. So the scope is water. Yeah, that's fine. Quality. Gary can say yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Elliot? This is someone else. Um, someone else someone else. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm pretty comfortable um, with option two in the sense that, you know, there, there clearly are some things that um, can come under that, that framework, and we do want to see. Uh, freshwater farm plans in action and, and, and see how they do work on the ground. Um, but yeah, I pr much prefer to be cautious in that space. And I think we can be dynamic and adaptive when we do, when we see them in action, you know, if they're working really, really well, maybe we could add some more activities under that framework. Um, and if they're not working as well, you know, we can restrict, restrict them more and, and make those activities. Um, Put those back in the in the current draft framework, um, but a, as it stands, you know, I'd, I'd want to be cautious um, with the use currently. Well, thank you, Elliot. Um, anybody else? I'll just um, uh, I support um, Elliot's argument. I actually get where Gary and um, Andrew are coming from, and and but I think a precautionary approach is better. It's very hard to call back stuff if things go wrong. And if there's too much risk involved in option three for my liking, so I'd like to get going with option two. Um, I think Tom, why do you have your hand up, Tim? Oh, look, I support that view too. It's um, you know, the risk is there still. And option two does actually um, take into account the, the value of farm plans as well. So I'm certainly sitting there, option two. Thanks, um, Tim Pritchard. 
Um, I think people are generally actually saying the same thing, that two's a tick, yep. And then um, they're open to locking, most people anyway, at what, is there anything else that could yeah. sensibly go into um, a farm plan? And even Andrew and Kevin, I don't know about Gary, he didn't mention that, but um, said that there might be some activities that simply don't fit in that. They're high risk. You want to be able to assess them at the beginning. Uh, but we're so fortunate in Otago to have a community that are right behind farm planning. And um, overall, Lloyd, yeah, I think that's true. Um, as a pathway, you know, we need to um, utilise these as much as we can. But I do think with a five-year horizon on the um, action plan, that does have potential for whether I, you call it a lag effect or not, mm -hmm. and also that assessment of what is fair and reasonable once the activity is already established. So mm -hmm. that's quite a different test from before the activity is established. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Richard. Do we have any other comments? Uh, here? Yeah, like I support uh, freshwater plans, and uh, I think they're important in terms of. Um, assisting uh, activities on land to um, reduce risk to fresh water. <coughs> um, but I think they have that value there and um, if them rolled out across the region, that's great. But I don't um, see them addressing the cumulative issues and what have you, that your consenting process is there to, to address, particularly uh, with the higher risk activities. We are coming out of a plan that has been deficient, just has not worked. We've been there, been in hearings and we've just skidded it on ice because it's, uh, we were disabled the way it was written. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really nervous about jumping to something that's not proven uh, to work in place of consent. So I just don't think our people would go down that track. Thank you, Edward. And Okay. Yeah, look, I'm 100% behind three and, this, and the, uh, the sentiments around there probably should be some uh, actions or some activities in there that, that still do need a consent. Uh, I've got no problem with that, but really we should be putting as many as possible in that way. We're, we're, we're under, we're, a couple of things we're really underrating is these certifiers are not only nationally trained, but they must come here and be trained in what Otago needs and what Otago wants. So we're, we're, it is not something that's happening in Taranaki. It's not that something that's happening in Waikato. It's what happens and what's required in Otago. So that, that lens is over them. We're, we're also not taking into account the actual, the, the actual hard and fast environmental work that the farming community is already doing. And, and there's streets ahead of these plans. There's streets ahead of what's happening. If you and, and if you're wanted to jump in a minivan tonight, you can come up and watch a presentation at Noslam and they'll show you what's happening in that area. Because look, the communities are streets ahead and these farm plans will be the catalyst. I, I'm 100% to, to drag the laggards up that haven't been doing the work, but they'll also give the people that are doing the work the tip to say we're on the right path. Let's get our actions down and show everything what's happening. Freshwater, so we, we write our land and water plan, all we simply have to do, so this, the lag time, sorry, the lag time. We, if we start asking for more consents around um, higher risk activities other than putting through a freshwater plan, we will have lag time because all these consents will not get written. They will not get written next week. And yes, you'll have things that the farms will have to do once they have a consent. But that, that, that will be a process no different to what we're doing now with our freshwater farm plants. And they're being rolled out and, and that will happen. But the work that's already happening will not change. It will still be going on. There's no reason that in our land and water plan that we cannot, that we can't signal that if the freshwater farm plan mechanism is not achieving the targets that we have set for our freshwater, that we can not then go and do a plan change to beef those up. I mean, I would far rather go that because that's that's the national direction. Why would we encumber people with more paperwork, with more consents, when we've got a freshwater farm plan that's nationally approved as part of the RMA, um, but 
I'm agreeing there's probably two or three or four things that need to be added to option three. Uh, so that's where I sit with it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, I'm, yeah. <coughs> Just kidding. I don't, I'll start where I started. I think if you look at a bell curve of farm practice, what we need is regulation that pushes the bottom people to, to do things well, it's better. There are, will be laggards. What we can't do with regulation is really piss off the people who are at the top end of the bell curve and showing people what really good practice looks like and what they can do. We also have to acknowledge that we as a council have not actually worked out what the issues sometimes are. And I'm really concerned that we haven't invested well to, we know what the bad attribute status may be. There are some issues <coughs> that we could be putting a huge amount of issues through resource consents onto land use, which don't is, aren't actually owned by the land use. I can give examples in the tire, I can give examples on the um, um, mini helicare and a whole lot where they may be AB and they may be a wastewater system. There may be a whole lot of other reasons. And we're just not smart enough to know what those are. And so what I want to make sure is we're not at the point that we actually undermine what some people are doing, which is absolutely outstanding. And so what does this mean for this? Let freshwater farm plans be the thing that people at the top end are doing and showing innovation, showing how things can work, showing that they're working to more than just fresh water, but the bell curve of farming practice has to make sense. If you're going to put everything well above that, and that's where I, I think you're just shouting it at, at a room that people will not innovate. And that's what my real concern is, is, is the outcomes we're going to get. And you have to give room for people to innovate and do some amazing stuff, because they're up to it. Thank you, Kate. Um, my thoughts. Well, lots of thoughts. Um, I think first, um, I think we've got to be really careful with freshwater farm plans and regulation and how they work in tandem. I think there's places where um, some fit and places where others fit. So a bit like what Kevin's saying. I think there's there are some things where you go you need to have a consenting process because they're like the solid wall type stuff. Um, but there's other areas, and I very much agree with what Kate's saying. If, if you've got to be really careful if you're going to regulate somebody who's really doing it, and and the regulations are only as you know to bring up the, the bottom of the regulations. Um, if you if you get the top end coming down to get the bottom end coming up, you're not winning. Yeah. Okay. So you got to so you got to be really careful that you take everybody on the journey. The big I understand the problem with freshwater farm plans is how do you use a freshwater farm plan to go beyond GMP to get um to reduce um nutrient loadings in specific areas. So basically, my response to that is. You, my response to that is the key thing with a farm, I don't know if it's a freshwater farm plan, which is there now, where it's an environment farm plan or whatever plan. The key thing is that it's certified and, and it's audited and the certifier is audited. So it still has like the reg tree function. So you actually can see how things are being done. So on a freshwater farm plan, if you're going to have a, um, if, it's, if it's set up correctly, where it's set up, it's, um, aspirational towards uh, catchment values and context, which will get new, more nuanced over time. And then you've got your certifiers coming in there, certifying and it's being audited. You're going to actually be on everybody's farm and you're going to know that everybody's doing something. You put in a, a regulation, um, you're not going to know whether it's happening or not. It's just a regulation. And most of the time, you know, people in that area just carry on doing what they're doing. So, so at the end of the day, all you're going to do is all you're going to do is um, demoralise the good ones and the ones that you're after, uh, you're going to actually have to invest really heavily to actually go and follow them up. To get to get um, change, if, to, if you say that we're over, we need consent so that we can reduce our nutrient loadings on change. Well, I'll, my response to that is sort of lots of things. Um, what makes us think that we know better than the team of certifiers out there in the plan. We can be wrong. We can over, we can over, overreach, go too far, go beyond what's required. We don't know what's happening on farm, where it's heading. We know that we're getting improvements. 
and we know there's lags, so it's all happening. So we may be jumping in with stuff that we to do before it's needed. I truly believe that in the end of the day, the best way to get um, over allocated catchments down will be by market expectations and neighbour expectations. Because as you go on and get the cordial going within areas, the market expectations, um, the, the expectations of the markets is the one that's going to drive it through. And then it's the expectation that your neighbour wants you to be good so that you can work together tandem to, to, um, to get your returns. And that's then that is starting to show through now because we're talking about doing, you know, introducing stuff which is getting introduced as we speak today. FAP plus, there's all sorts of environmental stuff going on as as part of farm business as usual. And so we need to actually embrace and encourage it to take it to the next level. I think, but having said that, I do believe where we have got over over allocated areas, one of my big beefs, that we don't continue over allocating it by allowing people just to come in and set up shop and, and over allocate the over allocations. So we do have to have some baseline rules and, and we need to have those ones that it's like, you know, you know, your, your intensification rule per se. You need to have those type ones where you say, this area is over allocated for dairy farming. We don't want any more in this area. And just be upfront about it. Because I don't think we're, because we're talking about trying to reduce, you know, allocation. I don't think we're being upfront saying that area is over allocated, particularly we go on an FMU basis where you've got massive differences of farming systems from one end to the other. We're not if we're not going out there with an honest mouth saying that area is over allocated, you've got to reduce half a cow to the hectare across that FMU, you know, make a difference. Because we don't, I don't think that's what we I don't think we'd be prepared to go to that to that stage. Because how can you manage it and how it's going to work out? So you actually have to get, you actually have to work with, you, that's your aim, but you have to be cunning about how you get to your aim. So to, and the over allocation over time, stop it incurring, stop it incurring and getting worse. And then over time, it's going to come back to an equilibrium. And you need, and we need to be thinking ahead of time. Always, we've got to be thinking ahead of time what the next thing is that these areas are going to change into and what those things are going to have impact on the on on the environment so i think it's really important like I, I do think there's some areas so i'm very much option three but with add-ons from option two um where we need it and we and we need to have baselines that are to get the bottom ones to move up but don't really brass off the top ones and then we need to have a planning mechanism to actually move the whole lot going forward over time so that you, we can get through, if we do it properly, we can get on the ground change on every farm. So that's where my thoughts are. Thank you. Any other comments? Got some direction there? Pretty much um, use farm plans where you can and there'll be places where we need regulations as well. So I guess we move on to the next thing. Which is? Dairy, dairy, dairy support. Dairy support. Which is the next page? Easy stuff this morning. Um, again, just a, a quick identification of how you might want to think about the next three rows in the table. They are uh, ones on the overall consenting for dairy and dairy support. Second is about stocking rate threshold, and the third is about a fertilizer threshold. Um, it's my suggestion to you that we deal with this as a group because it's all kind of in, they're quite interrelated, um, but very much in your hands there. Questions? I've got a question. Could you please define dairy support? Sorry? Could you please define dairy support? What's the difference between dairy support and beef? Is it what? Yeah. Oh, that's what yeah. 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 We have been uh, looking to use the definitions in the uh, National Environmental Standard for Fresh Water and dairy support in there. <coughs> 
is cattle that are farmed for producing milk but are not being milked, for example, because they're heifers or have been dried off and are grazed on land that is not grazed by dairy cattle. So that means not on the, the milking platform. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ron? Yeah, question. Um, just tell me here under option one, we you say oh, main... Sorry. Are we dealing with them, sorry, are we dealing with them together or separately? That was the first question. I can run through them all three just quite qu quite quickly and then we can have a, a discussion or you can deal with them one by one. Well, personally, I'll further be um, discussed separately. Mm -hmm. Okay, my question was in relation to the first one. There is. Yeah, we've got. Hang on a minute. Is it. Yeah, well, we'll we'll just, just, we just might just hold, hold a little bit, Brian. I think, yeah, I think we might. In my opinion, I think we should go one at a time with, between oh, dairy sorry. and dairy support. Okay. With the two different activities. Okay. Well, my questions in relation. Yeah, well, going, going right I'm sorry, I could have done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still got a lot of slides to go. Oh, just um, do a... Can I just clarify something that you said just a moment ago about the dairy support? So if I was, um, so I'm a beef fattener and I go to the yards and buy, or anywhere to on the farm and buy a hundred Frisian cows that have just come off milking and I take them home and fatten them and send them to the works, I wouldn't be defined as dairy support, would I? You wouldn't. Because they're not yeah. going to be milked again. Uh, this definition starts with means cattle farmed for producing milk um, is the, the definition of dairy cattle. Um, and so if they're not being farmed for producing milk, um, then no. They wouldn't fit under meat, the definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm, that's sort of the end of life cycle, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so they've finished milking, I've bought them, I'm fattening them up, the same to the works. So, which is quite a common practice, but I'm not really called dairy support. I'm, I'm fattening beef. That will be my interpretation yeah, of the yeah, yeah, Yes. Yeah, yeah. So just quick summary here. Um, the draft provisions had a consent required for both dairy farming and dairy support. Um, controlled activity status for dairy farming and with a range of, of uh, conditions and controls and if that wasn't met then they were discretionary activities. The two primary ones of those for dairy farming uh, related to a stocking rate which is the next row um, and uh, nitrogen inputs in terms of fertilizer use and the dairy support one also had that fertilizer use. So this first bit is about requirements, quite a lot of feedback on that. Um, to, to read there. Um, and we've given you some different options there. Um, but I think we've all read we've all read the stuff so we can have some any questions. We can we will we concentrate on dairy farm um, per se and start with or will you want them together? Yeah, happy to concentrate on dairy, on dairy farms to start with, yes. Um, okay. So my question on dairy farming is absolutely in areas where it's new, I can understand that. If it's existing, and this is what my, the blandness I talked about, which is oh, homogenous or whatever word you want to use, homogenous is probably appropriate with milk. Um, the, is understanding that some areas where dairy farming is possibly more of a risk than others, and that didn't feel like it came through, or the attribute states are affected more by new dairy farming, for example. Is it are there are there or I mean you've you've chosen to do this through FMUs 
on these rules. Mm. So that would not be option two. It would be, um, you know, either region wide um, for you or FNU specific based on target attribute states and risk. Yep. No. So, but what is the risk? I, I, I want to understand more the risk that you're working on doing that. I'm, I mean, I'm glad to see that in there. But what are the, the dairy farming includes a whole lot of activities, and you're just sort of putting them together and understanding those risks as you look at them holistically. Uh, can you give me an area that you would say, actually, look, this probably isn't as high risk because of all, and then so the other part of this, would you be staging this in farm plans? So we've talked about staging in the yeah, I'll do that, yep. that you got, um, and we can do that. Um, and risk is one way to do it in terms of water quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Just ask the first question again about, sorry. So I just want to understand, when this came out, Are there any areas of dairy, we, a good way of asking this, are there any areas in Otago where dairy farming isn't seen as a risk? Now, I've got uh, Dunson, I don't think, had a dairy or a dairy support rule. Mm. Is that because you see it as having no risk when there are so many activities around it? Region wide, the suggestion is yeah. what was in the draft plan for um, a region wide rule on intensification so that it would be, um, a new dairy farm would be controlled, would be subject to a resource consent throughout the entire region. Part of the reason for that is that you do get that displacement effect where if there are controls on existing dairy farms, then someone sees an area where there's no controls and that's where they set up, which may not, well, is possibly not um, appropriate. So region-wide, there was a control on new dairy farms, for and new dairy support. Yeah. You can use it was 2.5, sorry. Yeah. And then there was, in specific FMUs for existing dairy farming, um, was subject to a resource consent for existing dairy farming with those um, stock unit and fertilizer type thresholds. So, on those other matters, you're happy that they can be controlled? I'm sorry, I, yeah. I'm going to come back and ask this question. I'll think about how I'm going to ask it. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. You got any other questions or any other comments? I think that Brian's looking like he might something. You know, no, I did. I think you've answered it, though. Yeah, I think you've answered it in my concern. So it's, you've got to get a consent right throughout the region, but the basis of the consent will vary depending on whether it's controlled or discretionally, depending on your stock and your, and your fertiliser rate. Quite. So for any activity that would be counted as intensification throughout the region would require some consent. Okay. Within certain FMUs, there's a requirement for existing dairy farms <coughs> to get consent. If they're with, below a certain kind of level of intensity, which we've used fertilizer use and stocking unit to kind of as a proxy to estimate to the sort of lower intensity, lower risk farm. So they would have a controlled activity and any above that level would be discretionary. So that's that that was so that's the existing framework. Oh, yeah. No, 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 that's cool. I hope that's clear to everyone. And, and we now. picked the areas, the FMUs mm -hmm. that, that that those rules apply to, those um, rules on existing dairy farms as ones that had either high nitrogen levels in, in water bodies or declining trends. So the nitrogen was getting noticeably worse. And had a, you know, more than a couple of dairy oh. farms existing. And, and answer Kate to the question I think you're asking, um, where there are not FME specific rules requiring consents, then all of those activities that have the potential to have an impact on freshwater quality will have to be managed through a freshwater farm plan anyway. Okay. So they would, they would be picked up that way in terms of management practice. Okay. And the, the reason is that is they've done so, I think it's done some, and around the Howe flat and there's huge contention in the second round of consultation in that area with dairy farming mm -hmm. on water pores. <coughs> and it just seemed to me that it didn't nuance what would have been very clear feedback about that in that area, which surprised me. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. 
Anybody else? Really? Yeah, I'm just um reading through the commentary and putting back through some of the other papers and stuff and noting that um you know this was developed because GMP alone is not gonna be enough to meet the targets that we have to meet. Um, but I'm also like a little bit concerned because it says that even this rule is just to reduce that gap rather than to to close it per se. Um, and I'm just wondering how we can actually close that gap and 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 also if you might be able to speak to like why the the alternative rules that were considered to close that gap were discarded a while, a while ago. Sorry. <laughs> So one of the things that we've been really clear about with this plan is, um, and, and Councillor Wilson sort of talked about it earlier, is we don't do a lot of the why are these water quality challenges. Um, we don't collect land use information. We just don't have it. We're not in a position to drill down. Um, one of the things we want to do in the science team is pivot more and be able to answer those questions. Um, we've always said that this plan will only take us so far, and so it's really important that this plan isn't a once and done, uh, and that we continue to improve on it. So. Um, the key for this plan is to start that travel of direction, get some of the information we need, start answering the questions, and then we can start to refine as we go forward. Yeah. So it's not really an answer. I can't give you a specific answer, but in terms of the process and why we're where we are, um, that's why. And so it's really important that we can justify where we are now um, and going too much further, we things get um, shakier. Thanks, Elliot. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. um, I've got to ask a question, haven't I? Um, <laughs> yes, ideally. <laughs> it's taking till 12 o'clock. 10 to 12, just say, what's the time? I'll come, come back to me, Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back. Oh, sorry, Gary. Yep. Gary, can you yep. go? Um, the reduction expectation. Very short, sharp question. Did you say so what is it? it? Yeah, so the reduction expectation, what is the staff's? It's just a reduction expectation. But just to be clear, it's we're talking about reduction in contaminant losses, yes. not yeah. necessarily reduction in stocking unit or reduction. Yeah, yeah that's right. Outcome. So, so it isn't a reduction in potential farms no. in areas that no. are. No, no, we're talking about reducing losses. We're saying on a farm yep. by farm basis, set your baseline, and then there's an expectation that you reduce your losses. Let's go. Yeah. It's control. Yeah. So yeah, so can, decline. So all the consents mm -hmm. would be granted, provided they show that reduction expectation. That will make that reduction in losses. So there's an option for you to consider. I've got a question. Um, what, um, what reductions are you looking for? And how are we going to measure it? The, the plan sets out in its framework um, environmental outcomes and then um, target attribute states and then when they're in the long-term interim target attribute states. Um, so those are going to guide, for each FMU, those are different and are going to guide the kinds of reductions that are um, expected through those consents. No, that, uh, sorry, with all due respect. So when you're doing a consent, that's on a per farm basis. Mm -hmm. So what reductions on an individual farm are you going to target, and how are you going to measure? So how are you? So what? So how are you going to measure any reductions? Those reductions. Um, there are a range of tools to to measure some of those reductions, but some of those likes of overseer. Um, but in reality, there is also going to be a number of those that we can't measure as such, like of sediment loss or E. coli loss. And that's where there are some understood and anticipated uh, mitigations with reasonably known performance levels. Um, you know, critical source area management, those kinds of things would all be, um, be set out. Or those other contaminants other than necessarily nitrogen. So if you're going to use overseer, what number will you use? Well, so the thing with overseer in the regulatory space, sorry, jumped in so quickly because this is uh, conversations are going round and around and it um, is that it's really good for directional travel. So we wouldn't want to put a number in the plan, but once you've got a baseline, 
um, and provided the uh, version number doesn't change, then you can show direction of travel and downwards is the direction we're looking for. So that's the ability to use overseer. It's been used in consents in that way around the country for mm -hmm. a very long time. I've got experience with dealing with exactly that. Yep. Yeah, and it, and it can work. And I'll let Tom go before I carry on with that. Yeah, and I, I, I just got some numbers through my inbox yesterday. Um, there's a draft report that will be coming out in Canterbury in the future. And they were talking about, with their framework and their um, use of overseer, they were talking about being able to demonstrate an average reduction in end loss on dairy farms across Canterbury of 5% per year for the last several years. Um, that that's the kind of thing you'd be looking for and be able to and be able to achieve or be able to measure over time. You wouldn't be talking about applying a specific overseer number to 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 a FMU or, or but but rather looking for those reductions over time. I think um, what I was reading yesterday is showing in the Canterbury example they're starting to be able to um, uh, demonstrate change over time in a way that's pretty. Um, Useful. Oh, I'm sorry, well, I'm just trying to find out something that the consenting process offers that's not business as usual in a freshwater farm thing. So the, I guess the joy, and I've heard a lot of things about consents this morning, but the joy of a consent process is that it can enable on that farm by farm basis an assessment of the effects of that loss. So typically in that situation, we've been looking at nitrogen or phosphorus loss to water and below the root zone. And then what is the effect of that N or P loss on the receiving environment? And that is very much a technical job, which is a consent process. I'm, I'm all for farm plans. Um, but what you would then do when you look at the consent conditions is around those inputs into the farming system that relate to the, the N or the P, all the mitigation measures that then mean, hey, actually I am seeing a reduction staged over time. And you can do that either in driving an instant one or over time recognizing that some of those mitigations and inputs may change or may not change. Um, and that's where you get that ability to see that there is actually an improvement through that environment. So again, that's just based on my professional experience with these. No, thanks. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. I just can't see any stuff that's not already um, plan orientated because you can't measure it. Just to be one of the high risk activities yep, absolutely. in terms of a freshwater farm plan. And I, yep. without speaking for everyone, I would say staff advice would be it would be a real challenge to yep. get this um, across um, in terms of meeting our statutory obligations to do this via a freshwater farm plan. Yeah. So just putting it out there, and we can do that, but just um, in terms of a section 32 and justification, we, we would struggle. Um, so on, so on your losses though, um, on your losses in doing our Otago uh, catchment challenges context and values, will we not be putting in to meet our target attribute states that we will be anticipating in losses of no more than? No. Why not? That's not what a catchment context does. It pulls together all of the existing information in a target, so it'll tell us what our current attribute states are, and it'll yep. say, well, actually, we might want to look at addressing nitrogen, but it's not going to tell you how you do it or yep. what you need to do it by and when you need to do it by. None of that happens yeah, It's just plan. revert to the earlier comment. We don't have that information yet because we haven't, OIC hasn't collected this information. We haven't managed land uses. Yeah, we yeah, just, yeah, we yeah, just yeah, don't yeah, have it. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll tell you what they are and that we should look to do something, but none of that extra stuff is there. Yeah, so, so will that not be the role then of the certifier mm -hmm. to actually head the actions towards your target attribute states? They would, they would have to know more than our science and consent team collectively to be able to do that, and they, they don't. They won't. Even though they'll be well-trained and certified, that, that's not what their role is. Mm. So are there actions right to address the, the contaminant? Yes or no, mm. um, but not, not anything else around those numbers. Thank you. Um, Jake's got one relevant. Well, look, what I, I, I don't mind that, but I think there are some really good dairy farmers out there don't know who they are, but I'm sure Lloyd's one of them, or was, or his son, or someone, Adam. Um, but what I'm slightly concerned about Some is... shit sheep farmers around. I think that's a really poor comment, yeah. Kate. No, 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 The question is, if I look at the bell curve, there are some really good dairy farmers who are there at the top of the bell curve. I'm not quite sure we'll get the reduction expectations you need. And so the, the grandparenting concern I have is just how you deal with this. So I wasn't, um, it's in that context of bell curve of dairy farmers, 
how you deal with ones that are well ahead of the game, have already got reductions and actually don't, can't approve much more. And the same question will come up with sheep. So that would be something that would be assessed through our consent process. Well, yeah, but then you've just frustrated the very people we want to... Can, can I just make a point? You can't, you can't write a framework that targets, that just says, if you're a laggard, these rules apply to you. Oh, like, yes. in, in reality, that, I've it. had this conversation numerous times through the consultation process. I'm not the only person. And I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with it. And, and you know, we don't, we don't want to be frustrating those that are doing really good stuff. But in reality, when you write rules, you write them and they do, you know, it's, I'm yet to come up with a way that says, we're going to write this rule, but it only applies to you. And, and you know, unfortunately, we've just got to make the pathway one that enables those people doing really good things to continue to do it mm -hmm. and not, not frustrate them through time and cost and other things. And, and that will take a little bit of time. But the concept that we can just write something that only picks on them, I just don't think the system allows that. And, and it, but it's just making sure that there's the thinking. The grandparenting rules and some of the le legislation we've had has frustrated some really good operators badly. And as long as you're looking at it, um, and you know, the problem is that you've got a reduction in the expectation there. Right. I mean, yes. if I just may speak to following on what, what Richard said that the consent process can be designed to the level of risk and the level of activity status. And we've demonstrated that, that we are able to do that. So when you see something that is a controlled activity, the expectation of information and assessment is very much in line with it being a controlled activity and lower level of risk. And then the time and the cost is then in line with that. So I guess I just wanted to make that really clear that we, we do do that and it is achievable when it's presented up there as well. Um, Thank you. We that feedback. We've got um, Andrew and then Brian. Uh, we'll focus on... Um, number two, um, and then just thinking about existing dairy farming and dairy support activity. If those two activities have um, effluent uh, collection, um, storage, and disposal consents, and they also have intensive uh, winter grazing consents, what other environmental, um, uh, so what other risk activities would fall into the, that category of concern? You, you're with me, I said you are. Um, sorry to be a bit vague. Because um, I put the head on from less is more from a regulatory perspective. So I'm thinking all those existing activities, is there anything else that we need to be promoting for them to have um, better control of risk activities outside those two. Um, yeah, I certainly think you've captured two of the riskiest parts of the activity that might have water quality impacts. And I think that's where that mm -hmm. question is going. I think it's a good question for us to. Mm -hmm. So that would be my view when you have to summary and I won't speak to you. Thanks, Andrew. How many? Oh, Brian, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So what's the difference between option one and option three? Option one's the existing one that has the region-wide rule and then the more detailed FMU specific yeah. provisions, and option three is just a controlled activity for everything. It'd be region-wide. Region-wide. So option one is subtle difference. Option one's got nuances and it had those. Uh, so you don't want to talk about the things as a package, but it had those two parameters mm -hmm. that we got a lot of feedback on. We'll talk about those next, mm -hmm. which is the stock cow units and, and E. Um, option three doesn't have any of that um, more detailed or differentiation in it. It's just a blanket rule across okay. the region. Thank you. <laughs> um, anything, anybody else? Thank you, Tom. Oh, look, I, I'm perhaps being a bit naive and looking at this pretty simply, but um, the dairy farming has the highest impact on our environment, um, and we, we need the strictest rules around it if we're going to make environmental improvements. But I'm not quite sure which option does that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Option one, possibly the easiest one. Personally, I think, um, personally, I agree with Tim, we need to go with what the best thing is to make environmental impacts, which in my mind is undoubtedly freshwater farm plants. But that's probably not what we're discussing right now. Uh, my question is, because um, we're going to go on to 
um, your control type activities if we're going to consenting one. I'm just wondering if, what is the difference between a control um, a control consent as opposed to a permitted activity? Permitted, you don't need a consent. So you're basically ticking the boxes. We don't need to be able to say you've ticked boxes. So there's no, there's no, there's you've got to have real clarity. Um, so consent, mm -hmm. a controlled activity can't be defined, but there is a consent process that enables us to impose conditions. And it makes yeah. the monitoring process um, far more transparent. And, and the monitoring of um, permitted activity programs. Um, and yeah, we, we don't, it would then relate to how we would monitor that um, permitted activity compliance and the effects of those activities, which we wouldn't have the same way that we do under a consenting framework. Um, and also with upcoming repeal of the MBEA, our ability to um, monitor or cost recover for that permitted activity isn't going to be there in the same way. So um, yeah, there's, there's some other fish hooks with, with that, just so you have all the information. Yeah, just what, other, what other controls would we use? Well, I that to me. What other? Will you give me an example of a? If you have a controlled consent. What other things might? Well, we haven't. I don't know. We've drafted it on. We haven't drafted it up, but um, there might be some additional um, oversight of the freshwater farm plan. Mm -hmm. Some additional. Um, if you're uh, looking at that consent. Uh, reduction expectations, there might be some tracking through that farm environment plan and, and the reporting that might come in. So there's a range of things we haven't drafted up um, exactly what that might look like, but there are um, yeah, there are some additional things that we'd love to put in there. Yeah. And can I confirm we're just talking about dairy farms, not dairy support at this stage? It's unclear. We're not, I'm not, sorry, I'm not clear whether you're talking about one or both. <laughs> Just reference for the paper that we've got in front of us, um, which is headed up exactly that dairy dairy support. I assume that's what we're looking. So, so, so I'm, I'm old dairy support because for me dairy support is a completely different kettle of fish to a dairy farm. So, and I I just don't believe it can be linked together as one. So you you have a dairy farm and you have a dairy support farm. Some dairy farms have dairy support on the farm with them. But a dairy support farm, I have a dairy support farm um, currently, maybe not much longer. But what's the difference between often dairy supports are on a big larger farm, so it might be 100 heifers on a 3,000 stock unit farm, so you've got 100 heifers and 3,000 ewes and other stuff going on. So, you know, that's completely that's, you know, I'd like to, what's the difference between having that to having 100 fattening beef? and 3,000 ewes on the farm, because that would be the predominant dairy support property. My property, I have dairy heifers on my property, but if you bring out a consent, I have 100, 120, I can swap them tomorrow for 120 bulls. Okay, so I'm just saying, what is the, you know, what is the intention? Because, you know, you gotta be a bit careful, you know, what happens because of, you know, in my mind, that's exactly what will happen. Um, so you got to decide, you know, if you, you know, there's a lot of farms that have got, you know, mixed. Okay. So I think it's completely different because for me, and I'm just going to say completely up front, if you are requiring consents for dairy support as per what you said, that is 100% dairy bashing. That's got, that's founded on nothing other than we're targeting the dairy farmers. Dairy farm consents, different story. Because that's because that because dairy farm, dairy farms is different. That's a that's a farming system on one defined and defined area of land. Dairy support moves around amongst all the other stuff at the same time. So you can't narrow it down. So I think you've got to be very careful that you don't link the two together because they are not the same. So we're, again, just providing you um, drafting and direction based on what you've provided us, and we are happy to do something different. We just need that direction yeah, yeah. from you. So I guess I'm just really conscious that we need to have them, well, my opinion, yeah. we need to not have it slip through and then uh, without being duly talked about. Yeah, I, I'd concur with that. Um, we, I farm a, a Rohi rather than FEMU where there is no dairy farming, but there is dairy support. The problem with this, and Emma Moran, I think, 
talked about the grass, the fee budget. Mm -hmm. And the problem with dairy support is it's something that can come and go depending on the seasons, the, um, how much production has been. And equally, it can change. Um, I mean, some people have dairy support farms that are off in the dairy farmers and they bring their cattle up to our area. Others will, depending on what the feed budget is that year, will turn it on and off. And it becomes really hard to manage in a consent because it can be something that changes quite quickly. It is the risks, and I, I mean, again, I'm just going to go back to the risk matrix that that has. It comes down to I, A, the weight of the beast compared to beef. It will come down to how they are fed and how intensively they're fed. And I actually think showing what good looks like and to mitigate those risks is actually more important than um, just having a rule. The rule will give you a bar that people go to perhaps as a target. Whereas I think what we fail often to do is to say what good would really look like in the practice. And I'm really concerned about some of the practices I've seen where they're too intensively farmed together. Um, on the wrong soil, soils, on the wrong um, elevations or slopes, or the wrong height. And that's actually much more nuanced. So I'm not helping you. I see dairy, dairy as something that's really easy to see. Dairy support is something that um, is much harder to understand what you're trying to manage. And I think there's those risks mm -hmm. and clarity around them Yeah, that we need to be slightly. I don't think the freshwater definition is at all helpful. Um, on that basis, because I would have actually, I, I look, looked it up and I would have put his dairy cows that have just stopped being milked as being dairy support, even if they are just being done for meat. The weight's so, the same. Yeah. So we are limited. We can't really define things that are already defined in higher order legislation. So um, we're mm -hmm. sort of stuck with what this. So there's a whole lot of definitions in the planning standards, and you're not allowed to redefine things, etc. So on and so forth. Um, so we do have some constraints over things. Um, but if there's direction to separate those two things out, we can do that. Or manage only one and not the other, we can do that. And um, we just we just need some we just need some discussion on it. That's all so we can thanks, go. Thanks, Kate. We've got um Carrie, Andrew, Brian, Richard. Dairy farming's interesting because you're choosing to be a dairy <coughs> farmer, just like you're choosing to be a sheep farmer or a beef farmer or a mixture of them all. If you're a dairy farmer. You have the most intensive part of your dairy farming is the milking platform, and you have the support elements that you have to do. You've got to have young stock, you've got to have winter feed, uh, and you make hay and you do everything else that makes you your complete farm. The problem with dairying is that the most intensive part of it tends to be side, stacked side by side by side, and the support elements of it that lessen the intensity of that overall farming business are often in other areas. Um, the example Kevin raised of him buying um, cows to be fattened, when a perfect world of dairy farming, they'd be fattened on that property, they are a part of that farming business and they go to works because you have to be able to get rid of your stock or your progeny that you're producing as part of your farming activity. But we don't have that. And so, but what we do have, we have intensive winter grazing rules. We have freshwater farm plans coming and it is, you can have the variances. We just need the checks and balances and controls that sit around that most intensive activity if it's choosing to be segmented as opposed to being all done as one. And I think we are arriving at, we do it well at the moment and what we monitor in dairy, um, but we have some issues to tidy in some areas. So I think that we are getting to it in these options that are here, um, just a wee bit, wee bit more to go. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, probably not in too different a position to what Gary's just outlined, but why I wanted to speak was I think, uh, Louis, when you suggested that you know, we pick, don't pick one against the other, dairy and dairy support, I think in my mind, why we're here is we're thinking about the environmental impact of intensification rather than the environmental impact of intensification of dairy and versus dairy support. It's what, what's the environmental outcome of what are we trying to um, minimize, avoid and improve going forward? 
Um, so that's that's where my focus is. That I get what you're saying, but I think it's the outcomes that we're looking at rather than what's actually creating the environmental challenge that we've got in front of us. Are you talking about going forward or existing as well? No, what I'm, I come back to what I said before. I think that um, from my perspective, um, if we can if we can introduce uh, where we've got concern from environmental risk um, with existing activities of daring and dairy support, um, beef that area up, excuse the pun, but, um, and then for, uh, certainly have consents for new dairy support and dairy activities. That's, that's my position. I apologise, I said before I wasn't speaking again, so. No, you're a good, you're about to speak. Um, I've got a Brian. We're still in question time, yeah? Oh, we're doing a bit of both, Brian. Okay, um, well, Okay, um, my question was, what is the technical reason that you did link them together? Surely it's not because the council has told you to. Uh, I suspect it's because the NS Freshwater links them together, would be my, in the absence of no one offering a federal alternative. Okay, that no, no fair enough. I mean, and I accept the, you know, the, the, um, what Lloyd said that they deserve separation. I, I, you know, let's just look at the facts, not the emotion. Um, for me, the whole dairy thing, existing dairy farms and new dairy farms, a big multi-million dollar enterprises, high intensity in terms of um, environmental footprint and risk, and they deserve a consent. And we as a council um, have managed that through compliance over time, where if a dairy farm has, has performed well, then we only do the compliance uh, every number of years, you know. So um, the, there is some type of incentive there. And who, who's to say, maybe at the top end, they will, over time, go into the farm plan, you know, regime, whatever. But certainly in this instance, and I, I think that's option one. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, Richard? Um, yeah, I think initially you said that um, from, I think it was Joe, said that this is a high risk activity that the council has observed over the years. But I may have uh, just the. Uh, from a consent process of point of view, sorry. That was yeah, what I meant. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, and as Gary said, there is. Um, some intensity issues that come with um, the dairy support as well. But um, I'm just trying to figure out with what Andrew said as well about sticking to the facts of what we're actually trying to achieve here, which is anything that's intensive and likely to cause a real problem. That's what we're aiming to deal with. So are there other examples of things that are really intensive or are these the ones we've picked out that are the the ones based on our experience um, in the field. So we just need to reflect on that because we started with thinking about intensification full stop right across the region and we've got down to narrowing down on these one. We just need to really think about have we captured what we were intending to do for actual environmental outcomes. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. Anybody else? Nobody else? But the, um, basically, from my point of view, we're talking about this uh, before we go on. I'm definitely not opposed to having a regulatory framework for dairy farms because that's an individual thing. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, a dairy farm that, and when I was doing the feedbacks, I didn't get a lot of push, I didn't get massive push pushback from dairy farms regarding that. Um, some, obviously, but but because a dairy farm, if you have if you think about it logically, you've got your um you've got your point consents and and management consents, you've got your grazing consents if you're grazing on, and you and you've got your um and you need to have your freshwater farm plan. So in theory that all um feeds into developing most of your consenting process anyway. And it by having a consenting process, it means that you're closer to the action because it is a, high, a you know a higher risk environmental spot. Um, when you move that to your dairy support 
farming. I don't see dairy support as any different to beef farming. And the more the more we get into our regular regulatory frameworks, the more and more we're pushing people into cattle all the time. And so we're actually creating more intensification. And um, you can, there's been a trend over the, in recent times where you'll find, if you look at a few of the stats, I think Emma, she should probably, hopefully should back me up, but there's been reductions in sheep cattle, but the beef cattle pretty much been holding their own. So I think we've got to be really careful, um, you know, just around that dairy support stuff that it's not, that we are actually targeting an environmental, we're actually targeting a, a hot spot that's, that's not a easily defined hot spot. Because I just really worry about what, Five ways you're going to be driving up. Can There's just, 20 cows a dairy support block, 20 calves. It's, you know, it's just, it's just, um, if you're milking a cow on a farm, it's a dairy farm. You know, when you get into the next level, there's a whole lot of questions, there's a whole lot of gray area. As soon as you get gray area, you get angst. And as soon as you get angst, you get people who are not prepared to, you lose cooperation. So I think we just have to be really careful through that, through that zone. Can I just provide clarity? I get a sense that. Um, there might be some confusion. We do, do still have a general intensification rule. It's just that yeah, we didn't get a lot yeah. of pushback on it. Uh, so it's not featured oh, in these two oh, workshops. So yeah. there is still, uh, and there's a requirement to have that, so that is still mm. there, and that will go in the clause three version, just, mm. just to yeah, so that allays any concerns. That is still something that we'll be looking, having oversight over. So that's already in there for any intensification in already. So it's sort of like yeah. option two, pretty much nearly covered around. Dairy support side, anyway. Mm -hmm. no, I, no. I don't think it covers dairy support. No, because we've got a specific role, but I think, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the intensification only applies to dairy, not dairy no. support. No, it doesn't. No, it covers no, dairy. Dairy. Yeah. 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 dairy. We can clarify. We can farm clarify. Dairy farmland, yeah. and I think dairy farmland does not apply. Right. We'll clarify yeah. that Thanks. for you. Yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and probably my other comment is, I you know, I think we need to really think about we're going to have a control because you know, because I, I swear I've got on the head whether you do have a permitted activity, but I'm I'm more than I think the what you're going to discuss next is a diversion to actually what the outcome that we're wanting is really just a, we just really want to have a we want to have a consenting process for dairy farming so that we're closer to the action and the monitoring and stuff, um, and what was my one. Sorry. So you know that's pretty much where I'll that's pretty much where I'll Thanks, Kevin. Uh the freshwater farm plans were not uh, government policy now and already in the RMA, I would be saying that all dairying should be consented and it should have been when it started. Um, and it has been elsewhere for a long time. So I've got actually no problem with that around the risk associated with it. Uh, but now, um, I think we should only be consenting those parts of it that we see as the real risk ones, which is the dairy effluent and probably the, the water takes. The risk, the risk should be freshwater farm plans because otherwise we are got, we are, our freshwater farm plan and the next part of a consent will actually be doing this, will actually be doing the same job, which is ensuring quality freshwater, the right ecosystems, but we're going to we're going, we're going to be charging all those all those farmers that choose to go dairying twice. We're going to be charging for a consent. And we're going to be charging them for a freshwater farm plan. So to me, that's uh, completely yeah, that, that's just wrong. Um, so I yeah, no to, no to the consents because we've got the freshwater farm plan and but consenting the the parts that we already consent. Pretty simple. Thanks, Kim. Yes. We need to we're we're running behind time. Yeah, I think, I think we need yeah. to finish the dairy. So the two, the other mm -hmm. columns, and then yeah. um, break at right. that point, and then we'll have a work on what the afternoon might look like. Yeah. Do we get through this because it is all related? So there's no point in breaking now. So basically. So although there's a little bit of some diverse views around what we think we might 
might be best is if we go through these two and then we might just round back just to confirm the direction that you've given us. So this uh, <clears throat> in the draft plan, there was, although this says dairy and dairy support, this just related to dairy farms only. And it is the threshold of 2.5 cows a hectare where if you were below 2.5 cows a hectare, you would be through the relatively straightforward controlled activity consent pathway and above 2.5 cows a hectare, you would be into a discretionary activity consent pathway. So that's what went out for engagement. And as you're probably aware, there was a range of feedback on that. Um, some questioning, some relatively fine detail technical elements, but fundamentally about the 2.5 cows a hectare um, being the wrong number or um, not being an appropriate kind of threshold. So we've popped in a couple of options here for how you might, might want to consider thresholds if that's um, where you want to go still with, uh, with dairy farms. Uh, any questions or quick comments on that? Just from myself being a dairy farmer, I guess. Um, cows per hectare is a well-known ratio, but in reality, dairy farm, all dairy farms are different, so you're probably best to go well, go to your stock unit base based on dairy and zeds or whatever the national stock unit numbers, mm -hmm. which I think yeah, it's been in the discussion in the paper. So, so I think I'm so that's sort of like where if you're going to have a threshold, I think it needs to be based on stock units that way because a lot of dairy farms have beef cattle on them as well and bits and pieces of other things. Yeah, could I just suggest to help us with this conversation? We maybe start with the question. Uh, do we think we should have a threshold, yes or no, first? And then, because if the answer is no, then there's no point talking about what the threshold should be. Oh, <laughs> um, you mean for, for just for this conversation? For like control. a control? Yeah. Just, yeah, we'll yeah. try and go pretty quickly around. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, again, this is a nuance um, thing for me. I think that there are some areas of soil types, slopes, and, and the rainfall that this stuff, the soccer rate. So I like the third point on um, the feedback, stocking rates should be based on various other factors and we have to be much more nuanced. We have the second largest um, region in, a, in, in New Zealand and, and which doesn't, and, and one of the most, and I'd say the most diverse, and yet none of that comes out of this plan. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got the capability, I think Emma Moran's work has a really good lead on some of that stuff, that we should be using stocking rates, but it has to be much more nuanced into FMUs and even into Rohi. Mm -hmm of some of the existing FMUs that don't have ROV. Um, I think it, it's a, we, we can do better on that. And so maybe- So yes to a stock unit and more refined as, yeah, more as refined, the other. Um, a stocking rate, whether it's live weight, um, I, you know, live weight does make sense in some dairy farming situations. Thanks, Kate, sorry. Who's next? Look, I just think that's an absolute Look, look, it's just a can of worms, and, and it's absolutely right. You know, are, are we talking about, um, look, look, that goes back to the old days in the 80s when they had the um, stocking rate for uh, land improvement, and they gave you extra money if you put more stocking units on. So you just had, you just had more stock units, and they became skinnier. So I, look, you're, you're either going, and that's what happened in the 80s, and it was a disaster. Yeah. Uh, minimum SMPs, wasn't it? Your standard minimum price, and you got paid for stock in it. Look, the reality is, um, and, and you know I'm against it, um, and I'm saying it should be based on the, the top activities, uh, the effluent and the water takes should be consented. All the rest should be on freshwater farm plans. If you're going to go down the consent path, it needs to be everyone consented because there's, look, I... I'll just simply go to 2.4 stock units to the hectare and then I'll run them and I'll turn them into doing 700 kilograms of milk solids a day and you won't be able to do a thing about it and it won't have, you know, it'll have the opposite effect that you wanted to get. People will just shuffle it around. You're either all in or you're all out, as simple as that. So that's a no, but can I just challenge the 80s is not the old days? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> 80s is not the old days. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, for young people like me, it's the old days. <laughs> Thank you. I've given well, that, that's, look, 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 you're either um, it, you're either consented or you don't consent it. It's as simple as that because you just don't want to get into and it all happens in, in Holland with all their manipulations of stocks and all that sort of stuff. And so you either consent it or you don't consent it. You don't need to consent because you've got freshwater farm plans and you're already consenting the dangerous activities. So, Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, it's from Matt. You've had two votes on that now. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Thank um, I would prefer not to have uh, a measurement, uh, whether it's live weight or number of cows or whatever, and for us to put the energy and focus in where the environmental risk is on the actual activity, and if there needs to be a greater emphasis on uh, an additional, um, I don't know, um, an add-on to the intensive winter grazing consent or the effluent um, consent or some other, other identification where there is an environmental risk, put the effort in there. Uh, and on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think about Otago, and I think about soils, for example, if you have a generic approach. Imagine comparing the Tauri soils to the Dunstan soils, for example. I mean, they're complete opposite. Um, so I think that sort of um, one-size-fits-all is a dangerous track to head. Pass me the head down. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Gary? No, I agree with him. <laughs> Thank you. So no, good. Thank you. I agree with them and them and them. Right, that's another nice. Yeah, Ron? I believe, as I said before, the dairy farms need a consent. Um, and I also believe they need some type of threshold. What that threshold is, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure, because I also agree with, you know, you know, the comments that it varies, but we need something that we can measure. I think it's been a positive step forward when we did do the 2.5 cows because everybody could understand that. Mm -hmm. But I agree it's far from perfect. So that's Thank you, Rod. Um, Elliot? Yeah, um, I uh, think that, you know, um, stocking rates or, or some kind of equivalent is, is one of the best levers we have to... Um, you know, reduce the impact that uh, dairy farms have, um, whether it's nutrient load or, or you know, any of the other effects that we are wanting to limit. And I haven't seen, um, like obviously the 2.5 came from somewhere. Um, I haven't seen anything come up in all of the feedback that, um, you know, rejects that um, with evidence. And I, I, I don't, um, Think that I mean, as the um, commentary said, you know, the, the scientific support to change the that measurement to something like um, stock units or um, stock weight. I think that's perfectly reasonable, and I'm certainly open to the idea that it might need to be more tailored to the individual FMUs because um, there will be different conditions. I don't know how that would look, um, and you know, if there is alternative advice for that exact number, I'm perfectly open to that as well. But but as it stands, yes. Yeah. Um, just happy to um, keep it as it is, just changing to stock units rather than cows. Thanks, Elliot. We got um, Tom. Yeah, one of the reasons I stood for this council was that um, the Kakanu River got absolutely stuffed. Um, it was a river I fished. The intensification of dairy farming in that whole area, I couldn't understand how on earth it was allowed to explode the way it did. Um, I, I'm all for. Um, controlling, um, consenting new dairying units, and I think any controls around um, stock units which prevent that kind of intensification gets my support. Thanks, Tom. Um, can you look your screen? So yeah, I, I, I'll read it more soon. Hello, Gretchen. Um, yeah, I agree with. I think it's caked <laughs> most with the geographic areas are so crucial. When you look at the Waitaki gravels uh, versus some areas that can carry a lot more potentially, it is really crucial to determine. I agree as well that at the front end, the high risk activities should have consents. So I might disagree slightly on that one, but um, that's where we came to before. So I think that's where we should be. Yep. Sweet.
Same. 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 I think um I think we need to, I, I'm I'm happy enough with consents for the dairy farming stuff. I think it's really dangerous to be putting stock units or in in amounts and stuff in there because at the end of the day we're targeting the nutrient loss, not the actual the farming system. So you can have like low stocking rates with high high nutrient loss, and you can have um, high stocking rates with low nutrient loss. So you actually got to so by doing that, that's really I suppose what I'm saying is. Every the day you get, you can see every dairy farmers on the same footing. If that makes sense, rather than having, you know, um, trying to create, you know, putting the doubt in around that, around that. So it's because it's more about your nutrient loss as opposed to your stocking rate. And the and uh, um, fertilizer stuff's government controlled and the NES, which is good too. Given. Uh, just a question. So, if I if I have to get a consent to dairy farm, I won't need a freshwater farm plan. <coughs> no, you. Everybody will need a freshwater <laughs> farm plan, but you'll already have a consent covering covering that activity that you can refer to within the plan, so it won't be reassessed. Yeah, yeah. So it should be, should be quite cheap to get one. Yeah, it will, it will, it will yeah, just cost, and, that, and that's one of the flip sides. You throw everything into freshwater farm plans and it requires additional assessment, additional expertise, and we'll drive the cost of those up. So there is a, a balance. Yeah, but part, part, Lloyd, just um, on stock units, I want to really back up on that because part, part of the whole um, structure of dairy farming is the shear milker, uh, and the shear milker relies on increasing his stock numbers that he will then that he owns and over time he will sell. So generally you'll find that they'll run their farm uh, at a higher stocking rate than say an owner operator because they're trying to build up their stock numbers. It doesn't mean that their environmental impact will be any greater. So that's the part that really it's, look, we're talking about environmental impact. And I can show you, I could show you farms at around about two and a, two to 2.3, I think one is, that you wouldn't, they won't get a consent. But I could show you, fellas, at three, three to three point nine, and that sort of area that you'll be exceptionally happy to give a uh, to give a consent to because everything's just absolutely spot on. So, okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you. I think we're really quickly. Oh, the, look, the biggest question that came out beside this was, what area are you using, and the lack of a definition of effective. In, in fact, actually lack of understanding how that would be measured and um it's definitely in the submissions i don't think that there's um we cover it in the response but having that mm. covered off because it's counterintuitive if you're going to be doing effective area as opposed to the effective area is it weird yeah. sorry it's not the options or changes suggested though is it no, it's so there's 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 probably quite a number of um, suggestions for improving clarity that we haven't necessarily captured in here, but we will in the actual draft thing. So, so yeah, that is something that we will definitely. Yeah, thank on. you. Hey, I think we got pretty good direction on that one. Yeah. And then you just, the next one is your just your hundred units of fertilizer. Anybody think any different around the fertilizer? Yeah, yeah I'm pretty. Uh, the national standard is 190. Uh, that's in. That's scientifically tested, and it is working. It's working its way through. Everyone's everyone's going to it. And in fact, you'll find that people are actually dropping below that anyway. And I would say that that is the rule. Um, I, I don't know where. You know, I, I haven't seen enough science that that's scientifically backed. Um, so the 190 should be the limit. And if we've got our freshwater farm plans in place, uh, that will show that we're meeting our target attribute states. I've got no problem with that being the being the number at the state. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Thank you. Again, I agree with him. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I start some consistency here with vegetable yeah. growing? Yeah. I mean, on the road, great example, two options of salt. You know, we need to get vegetable growing as an alternative land use. Because it's usually done probably more intensively and average, it wasn't seen as one that would be over this 
problem. So this, this threshold was in relation to the Missouri consent pathway um, originally, just to, so we didn't, we didn't, we wouldn't have had a threshold for vegetable growing. Now the option or at least, and possibly some of the other options also apply more broadly. So I don't know if I've answered your question. Well, you have, and, and, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's an important one in areas mm -hmm. like. Just really quickly, I think we've got Elliot and Brian, because we've got to close off so we Sorry. have time to have some lunch before we start again at one. Yeah. So, Elliot. Like grandstand or anything, just um, keeping the existing framework with potentially adding option three as, as well. Thank you, Elliot. Cole says here, the area and dairy support significant contributors to degraded water quality in some of the a substantial reduction in the heat and phosphorus required. It talks about, um, you know, to indicate that GMP will be insufficient to be achieved. In some of them use more substantial reductions, especially of N and P are required. I spot the 100. Wrong. I'm probably with Kevin. Kevin Sorry, I think there's a couple of important things is that um, the use of synthetic E um, is tumbling rapidly uh, simply because um, you know suppliers to dairy companies or um, suppliers to um, meat processing companies are being encouraged to move away from synthetic E. So I would much rather have the option, uh, option five, where it's the mechanism within your freshwater farm plan that, um, that you um, use that uh, mechanism to, to ensure that we uh, reduce the reliance on synthetic end going forward. Thank you, Andrew. I think this is just for your controlled activity, if you have a controlled activity. Yeah. So my thoughts are, that's correct, isn't it? This is, not a, this is what we're talking about here, is not about putting, you know, going to a lower clue to the FDMU and saying you're only allowed to put on 100 units of end across the whole FDMU. No, it's a threshold above which you know we're talking about. This would be this a, is your control percent or discretionary consent. Yes, that's yeah. correct. So it's not. You understand that. So well, one of the options there is to mm -hmm. set a firm option three is to set a firm cap to basically be like the National Environmental Standards got the one ninety, which is a really firm cap. Firm cap to go from one to the other. Well, no, under the National difference. Environmental Standard, you you can't really go above one ninety. Yeah. Uh, so one option could be that. You might suggest that we could set a cap at uh, at 150 as one of the options there. But in general, we're talking about just this threshold to move from one consent status to another. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. That's when it starts off. Dairy use over 100 kilograms per, requiring the discretionary consent. Yeah, but 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 that's a but I didn't understand that. So the that one three, that's a firm cap across a whole FMU area. Yes. Okay, I pretty much don't agree with that. Um, so I, I, I still agree with what I said the first time, which is I think we should have consents for dairy farms and have everybody apply as based on um, environmental, you know, loadings. And every farmer, so if you, because if you are if you are a low impact dairy farmer, it's going to show through, and you can see the process rather than trying to define it because I think it's. Very hard to define. Thank you. Anybody else? Option one, sorry. Oh, I was just wondering what your option is, Lloyd. Yeah. Well, mine's not mine's not Lloyd's option, which oh. is <laughs> option one, but without having a controlled activity, have everybody discretionary. So we've had quite disparate. Mm. views around yeah. dairy in general um, and I, I think that's the best way to sum it up we were going to round back what I think the best approach might be is on the 14th we give you two quite different models um, <laughs> for how we manage dairy and I think um, and we consult on both and I, I don't I don't think we're going to get mm. one at this point and so my preference would be let's test two um, mm. broadly speaking one that's not consented and one that is and then we can discuss the detail in there and I, I think that that would be the best approach if that's something you can come with. Thank you. I think as part of that too we'll just do a little bit of thinking about how about our ability to control some of these things through a catchment context and freshwater farm mm -hmm. within an EVMU because yeah. I think I've heard that 
from a lot of people, mm, yeah. but we need to be confident if we're offering mm. that up that it's something we can achieve through that process. Yeah. We also, yeah, also think you don't have a consent, so it has to be a cargo wide. You can't have some areas mm -hmm. that don't have a consent. It's just, it's a good sense. Mm, well, depends on the risk matrix, really. Yeah, they've, they've got low risk, they'll get easy So we'll break for lunch, adjourn mm. for lunch. Um, we have to be back for one o'clock. No, not the last. Okay, I need to run these half an hour. Half an hour for lunch. We just want to pass. Yeah, pass. Want to pass? Okay, thank you.